Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Thanks for joining us today. As the video says, Cleveland rocks. We're excited to have you here today as a continuation of our weekly webinar series. Today it's just a little bit different. Uh, I'm really excited to be back in this chair. Kelsey uh, stole my thunder the last several weeks on the weekly webinars with you all. I see some a lot of familiar names in the attendee block. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We've got a, a great webinar today. It's our virtual user group, our first of 2021, our second ever. Uh, really excited to have you all here. So with me today, uh, starting with me today, I've got uh, Tom Barrett, our CEO. And he and I are going to kind of open things up and get things interesting, um, get you guys using your controls there. We've got some polls for you along the way. My name is Don Cook. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at 7Signal. Uh, and I'm going to walk through the agenda today. I've got a couple items to get to before that. Uh, and first is a big thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, we're really excited about the popularity of our, our weekly webinar series. Uh, today is no different. Um, you guys may not know this number. Um, Tom and, and I are really proud of it. We had over 5,000 attendees last year in 2020 in our weekly webinars. So that's all because of you. You help us with the content. You keep things interactive. And we wanted to thank you very much uh, for joining us each and every week. Very exciting for us to see uh, these numbers continue to grow. So um, a couple of things to walk through. We're going to drop a couple things into the chat today. So keep your eye on there. We've got some nice incentives from Gartner and Captera to write us a review today. So uh, please take a moment to do that throughout the webinar. Uh, and please interact and ask us questions as we go. Um, they're going to make the, the content a little bit more relevant to the audience. If you hear something you don't understand, drop us a chat, and we'll be able to ask that uh, question to the presenter. We've got a couple polls. Uh, they're going to jump up on your screen as we go. So keep in mind, uh, as those come through, we'd love you to participate. Uh, it gives us a little bit of information about who's here today, and we're going to kick those polls off in just a few minutes. Um, and also, uh, while I've got your attention, we've got a really great uh, content calendar coming for you this year, and a new guest coming in March, uh, Mark w or Jeremy White, excuse me, from uh, Wired Magazine. He's the executive editor there. He's going to be with us the end of March, so I'm excited to share you uh, with that information today. Uh, you're the ones who've heard it first. You hear it here first. Uh, very, very cool stuff we've got coming your way. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to look at the agenda, uh, here it is in a nutshell. Um, we've got uh, Tom Barrett, who's going to open up some remarks here in just a few minutes. Uh, we've got Mark Leary from IDC, who's going to do an industry briefing specific to our industry, and then talk a little bit about Seven Signal Value. A lot of you on this webinar have seen the uh, business value white paper that IDC did for us. We're really excited to share those results and go into detail on, on where, those, uh, where the ROI comes from. We've got a fun customer panel hosted by Jim Vada. Uh, we've got special guests from Nike and from um, IBM. And then a man who needs no introduction, Keith Parsons, is joining us. He's going to give us some, over, some uh, breaking news, if I understand correctly, from uh, WLPC 2021 um, today. So you're going to get some real insight into what's coming back to the community through Keith Parsons. We've got our VP of product, Simon Renouf, is going to join us today. He's going to give you an insight into our roadmap. And then to close things out today, Kelsey Rizzuto is going to join us. We've got a Name That Tune uh, contest coming up, so uh, please stick with us for that. Um, that will give you a chance to win an Oculus 2. Um, so uh, make sure you stay till the end. So with that said, I'm going to pass the controls over to Tom Barrett, and he's got a, a couple of opening remarks we're going to walk through. Great, Don. Thank you. And um, as Don said, welcome to our second virtual user group. And today we have over 400 companies from 20 different countries. 20 different countries, yep. So uh, thank you all for coming. We appreciate your business. We certainly appreciate the feedback, the input over the last year. And rest assured, we do listen. So uh, keep that coming. Uh, so 2020, if I were to summarize that, it's a year of pivoting. So it impacted all of our customers. And the best way I could summarize it across all industries is, is the FUD factor, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Right. Um, we had customers that expanded. We had customers that stopped. We had customers reduce. Um, and uh, as we worked with them, we had customers change products. 
Uh, so it was crazy. And probably the most interesting fact early on in COVID is work from home alone increased Mobileye over 200%. Um, so that's an interesting fact. We're certainly uh, looking forward to Simon's section where we spent a long time vetting and developing our long and short term product roadmaps. Uh, and you'll hear a lot of those uh, results today from Simon. And uh, also from the product perspective, now it's positioned to scale to millions of devices for each for customers to be able to deploy quickly and monitor flexibly. So you have le flexibility within uh, the client. And as Don said, I'm really proud of this uh, for the company. Both Don and Kelsey started this education on Wednesdays. We've delivered over 5,000 hours of free Wi-Fi education and over 2,000 uh, hours of virtual edu on-demand education. So watching the videos after the fact. So to my knowledge, I think it's the largest free Wi-Fi database of education in the world. Um, I might be wrong, but from everything I could find, uh, I think it's the largest. So continue to enjoy that. It's not product specific at all. It's all about industry topics, uh, which we pride ourselves on. And then moving forward into uh, 21, you know, from the Gartner research as well as uh, some other analysts, we found that uh, the trend is moving some of the infrastructure spending to supporting remote workers. So we're certainly aligned and positioned well to support you in that uh, effort. And we call that, again, moving to the edge, truly the outside in, and the actual client experience with an intelligent client. So uh, with that, uh, my, my final bullet about IDC, hopefully you've all seen it. If you haven't, it's, it's on our website. And we're happy to send you the, the short version or the long version of the report. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it today. But uh, the ROI, uh, especially for the C-suite, is extremely powerful for Mobileye. So we found companies been able to reduce expenses, increase revenues, uh, increase um, uh, support uh, time, and have people focused on really productive, high-value things. And Mobileye was the catalyst to do so. No so with that, I believe, Don, you have a couple poll questions you want to talk about? I do indeed. So uh, Tom and I want to know a little bit about you before we kick things off so our panelists can um, tailor their conversations a little bit more toward uh, the audience we've got today. So our first question, if you've been with us, uh, this is one we ask every week. Uh, we'd love to know if you're logging in from home or uh, your remote office or your home, uh, excuse me, your office or your remote uh, home office location. So if you could take a moment to let us know where you're logging in from. I have my guesses. I'm, I'm guessing everyone's remote or the majority of remote, but we could be wrong today. Well, according to Gardner, uh, 78 to 80 percent are remote. Let's see if they're uh, right. Yeah, let's, let's check that fact. Uh, yeah, so 80 percent, 80 percent remote. Uh, funny that it lands on that. So we'll give, we'll give uh, Gartner a, a, a thumbs up for that one but not too much because we've got IDC with us today. <laughs> so, uh, and, and uh, Tom and I are downtown um, Cleveland today. Uh, Kelsey and Jim Vodder are with us as well here downtown. So uh, we're working a little bit remote. We're not in the, uh, the headquarters, but we're downtown today. So um, without any further ado, we've got Mark Leary um, from IDC who's going to kick things off for us on the presentation side. Uh, he's got some really interesting data that he's going to share with you around uh, what's happening in Wi-Fi on the network side, um, refreshes, what's going to happen this, uh, in the next 12 months. So I think this is going to be uh, quite an informative um, section for you all. So sit back and enjoy. Mark, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Don. Thanks for the introduction there. And uh, Tom, thanks for your comments as well. And today we're going to be speaking very briefly about uh, the network analytics and automation industry. And it's literally an industry unto itself with many different people offering many different types of solutions. But I'll talk about best practices that we're seeing from both suppliers as well as enterprises who are putting these solutions into practice. And we'll also focus the final portion on the business value study itself. Uh, many of you have seen a copy of the report. I was involved in that study, uh, came up with the interview guide and did some of the interviews myself. So it's a very interesting view of how we do these studies and it provides some insights behind the results. And, uh, and then we'll do a Q&A after I finish up talking on the business value study results themselves. Let's first lay the 
level set everyone and and many of you in the audience especially i'd be surprised if any any one of you are not experiencing these pressure points is you've got tremendous pressure to support business transformation in your organization you've got to develop the best possible user experience you've got to provide absolute integrity of not only the network but the resources that are connected to the network and all of those connections to both end users as well as end devices in an IoT environment. You're trying to simplify your engineering and your operations and also make sure you're getting the best use out of all of your resources. Uh, you know, in the old days of network management where we didn't have much visibility um, in our networks and how our resources were used, it was not uncommon for people to, oh, once we got to 60% utilization of a router or a wide area network link, it was time to upgrade. Well, you know, all of a sudden that leaves 40% that we never used. With increased visibility, we're able to use more of those resources more effectively for longer periods of time. We can operate in tighter thresholds. And that's really key to timing your upgrades properly. Again, getting the most out of every resource that you've invested in. And finally, that visibility adds to your ability to adapt, adding new devices, adding new applications, adding new users, adding new sites, adding new policies. These are all things, adding new technologies. These are all things that you're trying to do as you introduce some of those technologies we see on the right. And this is a short list. This is, this is not even a complete list because many of you, I'm sure, have multiple projects going on in this list. And even across, even if you extend beyond this list, these are the technologies that are coming at you that are enabling your adaptation and are enabling to meet the needs of business transformation. But they also require significant investment themselves. They are, they are oftentimes will outdate what you have previously. So you've got to redo your legacy environment. And this and obviously all incorporate a tremendous responsibility to do systems integration right. And while you're trying to transform and introduce all these new technologies, you're trying to do it, it says with less, but for this, for this slide, you could really say with the least. And it's not so much that budgets are lessening or the staff is less or that you have less tools, but you are trying to get by with the least amount of budget and the least amount of staff. You're trying to wring every ounce of productivity from every dollar spent, from every staff hour spent, every tool that you've invested in or that you're using, the training you're providing to your staff in order to build their own expertise. These are all things that you're trying to get away with to make sure that you're using as effectively and as efficiently as possible. And I'm reminded, I'm aging myself here, but you know, I'm reminded of the Wizard of Oz when Dorothy and her three friends are going through the woods and they're thinking about all the possible hazards and they're thinking of lions and tigers and bears, oh my. And they're roaming through the forest. And that's a lot like the network staff these days. A lot of technologies, a lot of business responsibilities, a lot of new roles that are required of the networking staff. And again, you've got to move forward and you need tools that allow you to move forward. Network purchases reignited. We saw throughout COVID and many of you experienced this firsthand is COVID happened and suddenly the network was, was you know, ran the gauntlet. Suddenly workers were changing their positions in the network. They were going home. Uh, new connections were sprouting up to other businesses. As you tried to change maybe supply chains, or you tried to change how you were doing business with partners. Suddenly everyone was remote, but business needed to move on. It needed to continue to execute. That resulted in a lot of people taking a step back from investing in networking. You know, all of a sudden those router upgrades or those new switches you wanted to put in place or the new Wi-Fi network you needed to put in place, suddenly a lot of those were put on hold because, you know, who knew what the future held? You know, who knew how long the pandemic um, was going to last? And as we go into 2021 now, we're still battling the pandemic, but we are trying to get things back to normal. 
And we're trying to make up for lost time that we saw in 2021. That means we're spending again. It's funny, if we looked at the spending survey and this question was asked in a survey that IDC did back in June, July timeframe, and we saw negative results for data center, for WAN, for, for enterprise campus LAN. The two places we saw positive investment were in network management and unified communications and collaboration. UCNC is obvious in a work from home environment, in a remote environment, UCNC is a necessary tool to just do business. It's not just a convenience thing. And network management, the increase in spending there is a reflection of through COVID, people were no longer, they were less concerned about what they were networking. That is buying new switches, buying new routers, upgrading devices, upgrading systems, things like that. They were suddenly much more concerned about how they were networking, where their staff was focused, what tools they were using to manage their network and manage an environment that had changed radically in the United States in early March for the world, maybe a little bit sooner. And now you're seeing network management in the middle of this graph, actually investment in management continues on and actually overrides investment in data center networking and campus land, for instance. Wi-Fi is still a significant place where people are making an investment. The world has changed, right? Suddenly, you know, we are we need to operate in a different world than we did prior to COVID. The world, the users are more mobile, and devices are being connected up in an IoT scheme wirelessly. Wireless is becoming the predominant connectivity means, not just for the home or in remote locations, but even within corporate central cores and regional offices, and certainly in branches. And you see also up above there cloud managed networking, people are looking for the same kinds of cost effectiveness out of cloud managed networking as they are from traditionally cloud managed computing and remote work solutions in a new world. We see some statistics later on in a couple of slides that show that the world has indeed changed relative to who is working remotely and how many of our end users are working remotely there. But again, here you see network management greatly influencing the growth. And to give you some idea, it was interesting, we've been tracking, we've been doing surveys every couple of weeks throughout the COVID uh, pandemic. And we've been watching these trends here. And it was interesting, uh, there were two things of real note here. As you would guess, spending in unified communications and collaboration had stayed fairly positive through the pandemic. Makes perfect sense, everyone's trying to communicate, collaborate remotely, so they make investments in UC and C. The other thing that was interesting is matching the growth and in investment in UC and C was investment in network management systems. So suddenly people, and, and I can tell you all the investment in the infrastructure, data center, WAN, campus, all of that was down throughout 2020. And the reason for that is I think a lot of people were taking a step back and reassessing how they do networking. Not what they network, but how they do networking. And that focused a lot of emphasis on management systems and management practices, as well as the staff and what they're doing. And that's resulted in some real change. And those change are long running, as you see, and, and to tie it into seven signals, certainly, the, the upper bars there with the red arrows. So not only are people investing in smarter network management tools, but they're also very strongly focused on the Wi-Fi environment, remote work solutions, which makes perfect sense. And I have some data for that later on as well. And cloud managed networking. Cloud managed networking has a very interesting uh, benefit, a number of interesting benefits for those people that are, again, figuring out how they wanna do network management better, how they wanna run their networks better. On the left side of the equation, you look at things that have changed. What are points of emphasis now since the pandemic hit? As, as we all know, in uh, you know, digital transformation, everyone was facing pressures to transform digitally over the last many years. COVID certainly served as an accelerant for all that activity. So had people examining how they do networking and what's changed. 
And so really very quickly after the pandemic struck, it was a discovery that we better automate more uh, processes. Uh, we better rely more on the cloud. We saw a significant acceleration in cloud service uh, adoption coming after COVID. So as, as successful as cloud has been the last 10 years, we ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, it is further accelerating due to its elasticity and flexibility that cloud brings. And one thing the pandemic has proven that flexibility and elasticity is a real key to success. And there you see too, again, focus on analytics, understanding what the network is doing. Now what's changed permanently as we look at 2021 and beyond, what's changed permanently? And we'll see the next slide that talks about remote work. But again, that orientation around network management tools, more integrated and network security management. One thing the pandemic has driven is it, bro it has broken down some of the silos that we've seen traditionally between the network and security staff. You know, the acceptance of networking tools within the security domain is, is, is something that's accelerated as a result of the pandemic. And the ability for the network and security teams to work together um, really has been, drawn, has been driven by necessity throughout the pandemic. You only have so many staff, suddenly your users are spread all over the place, threats are coming from every which way. And again, teamwork is really very, very important there. One thing on the lower end there is you see an increased focus on the end user. And again, driven by COVID as people move remotely is the sudden focus on figuring out you know, what is the end user experiencing? What do they see? So instead of the network management staff just focused in on how are my routers performing? What, uh, what's my utilization on my bandwidth links? What's, uh, how are the switches doing? How are my policies and such? All of a sudden, there was a much more spread focus towards the end user and what the end user sees. And we did, I saw the poll earlier about remote working and it does change organizationally. Uh, tech employees, IT employees certainly have a lot more flexibility and tools available to them. So you see very high percentages of IT folks working from home over the last 11 to 12 months. And uh, some of that will certainly continue. I saw 88% of you or something were dialing in remotely today. So that flexibility is great. But on a broader view of how the workplace has changed is that you know, we look at before COVID, about one in five workers worked remotely. And this is across all industries, you know, all size companies and everything. And again, another 40, another 17% or so worked in a hybrid environment. So they worked sometimes from home, sometimes from the office. In the post COVID world, you know, and you saw the, the thing kick up significantly, obviously throughout COVID. And what happens as we settle in, as we start to emerge, and Lord knows we all like to emerge from COVID sooner rather than later. But as we emerge, what's the outlook? And you see significant uptick in both people working remotely full-time as well as hybrid. And I'll tell you, I think the hybrid number is an underestimation. I think that number, you know, people have grown very used to not commuting. And I think that uh, that hybrid number which before might have been, you know, one day a week or maybe two days a week, suddenly in the post-COVID area, it could very well be, you know, two or three days a week. So that could very well increase as well. And you look to the right there is, is how, and you, when you, we look at just the work from home users, how do they affect um, your help desk situation with performance issues? And again, these are people are operating at home, they're op or they're operating in a coffee shop or wherever, but they're operating not on the corporate network. So you have very little control over what they're doing. So their you know, agent-based views of their experience are absolutely critical to understanding what's going on in their environment. And again, you may not have control over the network infrastructure in their environment, but again, being able to see what they're seeing, because that's what's going to drive the help desk call. As soon as there's a slowdown, the help desk call happens. And as you see, you know, the frequency of calls from work from home users, it's pretty frequent. And certainly anything you can do to drive those numbers down have a great effect on the efficiency of the staff and certainly on the satisfaction of the end user. 
I just wanted to take a look at network management products these days. It's a very simple diagram, but it's one that, you know, I've been in the networking industry for a long time and network management has really grown tremendously the last few years. And, you know, it's been fo so very focused in on configuration and deployment for the first, you know, few decades of the IP world and the web world. And now we're getting to a point where we're being much more proactive. We're operating in, with much more detail relative to understanding what's going on in the network. Obviously with 7Signal, they're focused on that last wireless connection with the end user. But for, you know, that's still, that also applies to the network in its entirety. You know, collecting data across the network, providing as intelligent analysis as possible. You see the incorporation of a lot of AI and machine learning algorithms involved in the analysis here. And finally, the automation that's driven by that smart analysis. The more data you have, the more accurate your analysis, and that drives a more precise and productive directed action. That's management automation. And let's face it, automation is a big priority for IT in general. Uh, in the surveys that we've done over the last six, nine months or something, it is uh, most common to have IT automation as the number one focus for IT organizations. Um, and, and that's not driven necessarily by COVID, it's driven by the fact that a lot of those things from the first slide, lots of technologies ch changing, demands by the business are changing, you've got to keep up. And the staff, the only way out of this is to understand how to take repetitive tasks, make them, you know, make them operate themselves, again, how to fix problems and automate that process. So again, delivering a lot of productivity to the staff. And what about that staff? I, I, I've been looking at uh, staffing and training uh, for a long time now in networking. And it's, it's funny for the first, you know, last few decades, we've certainly been judged as networkers on the left side of the equation. How many sites do you control? How many devices do you control? How reliable is your network? What's the uptime? You know, how do you, do you operate within budget and such? Highly tactical responsibilities. So the role has been very technology specific, operating in a silo, and it's been very tactically focused. Well, in the digital business world, we're being asked to deliver more business outcomes, focus more on the end user, deliver the kind of services that allow the business to be very nimble and be ready for anything. Let's face it, you know, digital is about speed of movement. So being able to be ready for that next digital application is a really key to success. And as a result, that has networking staff, networking experts, the folks on this call, involved in many more projects, focused in on readiness as opposed to reliability, and a focus on business outcomes, much more about, you know, it's funny for a long time, it's been focused on hardware longevity. How long can I make my router work? Uh, is it three years? Is it five years? Is it eight years? Now it's all about how quickly I can change out software and how can I create services faster so that I can keep pace with digital. And that gives me, if the more that you automate and the more that you rely on systems to take care of those responsibilities on the left, the more that frees you up to do the responsibilities on the right, because those left side things don't go away in the digital environment. I mean, this, these, you know, but you want to be able to rely, rely on systems to take care of that automated systems, analytics, and wherever you can get help on the left helps free up time on the right. And that's a big, as we'll look at the ROI study later on, that is a big factor in the move towards network analytics, not just in the Wi-Fi environment, but across the network in total. And from a career perspective for network staffers, you know, this creates a lot more value for you to the organization. It gets you away from being, again, just a technologist focused on reliability and keeping the network up and such. Again, it gets you more involved with those lines of businesses, with strategic projects, it has you working across the aisle with security and application developers to make sure that again, your network is ready for anything. The short list in looking at network management, and this is a lot of what I'd look for uh, over the next couple of years as we go. And uh, this is a short list. There's a lot of things that 
uh, need to be adjusted. And you'll hear a roadmap from Seven Signal earlier, and some of this uh, probably uh, you know will show in that roadmap. I must say I haven't seen the roadmap presentation yet, so this is not driven by anything that they've included. But these are things that I look out over the industry and look at network analytics tools and automation tools. And you know, where are the thing, where are the next big gains to be made? Um, automation gaps. There is a significant gap between all the data that we can collect across our network and all the intelligent analysis that we can do on that network, on that network data. And then what action can we take with that analysis? Today, it's about, you know, hey, a lot of alerts go off and such, and the analysis can tell you which alert really matters. Um, some systems even provide some guidance in terms of, you know, how you could maybe fix the problem. Maybe they offer options for you. But what we're looking for now are triggers that actually kick off automated functions that then take care of those problems for you. Or they react to a trend, or they react to a threat profile or something. So they take a much more active role once they've performed all the analysis. Cloud blind spots. Many of you are here focused in on your Wi-Fi network and with the work from home pressures and all of that, and just the general mobility of the user population these days, and the addition of IoT devices uh, through Wi-Fi connections is very typical these days. You're focused on Wi-Fi. But getting larger and larger are the blind spots associated with cloud. I'm sure many of you work in organizations that have that have a multi-cloud strategy, maybe a hybrid cloud strategy. So you've got a lot of pay attention to there, a lot of potential blind spots. And through our survey views and our own look at cloud service adoption, those blind spots are getting bigger. And as a result, knowing what's going on within those clouds is very important. And knowing what's going on around those clouds is very important. So that you can present evidence to the cloud provider when you're working together to resolve problems. Security exposure, it is, uh, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's kind of a dual-edged sword. On the one hand, you know, network visibility, network analytics presents a wealth of information to help you strengthen your security posture. But what does that also do? It also makes you very vulnerable if somebody gets into your network and is able to have access to all of that information. Uh, the SolarWinds example is a good one here, where again, they use a very sophisticated technique to provide for, to provide for functionality within the build process that allowed them to view what's going on within people's networks. So while you're looking at the details of their network and you're thinking about how to do network management better, and you're spreading some responsibilities for your network management across multiple people, just think to make sure, or maybe you're using outside vendors, cloud vendors or VARs or something, just remember that that's very vital information, shows a lot of what's going on across your network, where people are going, what they're doing, who's doing what, all of that. That's great information for you for network management, but also presents some real security exposure. So be aware of that. Customer success. Tom mentioned in his talk, a very interesting thing is, is the education that they've been providing. Network, I've been tracking network industry for a long time and most networking purchases, you purchase a bunch of routers, you purchase a bunch of switches, whatever, you, you bring them on, you turn them on, you activate the service and off they run for years and years and that's great. I found with network analytics and automation solutions, it is very, it's very interesting to find that the oh wow moments can occur on day two of installation, but they can also take place two years after installation. You mean I can do that with this tool? And again, that customer success orientation, education that's provided by suppliers, the consultant service that's coming, that's coming through for suppliers, them understanding you, them matching up your environment and your needs and your challenges against their product is very, very key. And finally, solution evolution. You know, we're, we want smarter analysis, AI, machine learning. The smarter the analysis, again, the more accurate the analysis. And that can kick off a world of great automation if you're doing it, 
be able to take those precise management actions. New technologies is, is the next Wi-Fi environment for you. Wi-Fi 6, is it 5G? Uh, you know, the jury's out on that and there'll be decisions made, but obviously the Wi-Fi implementations are going to, the Wi-Fi is becoming, you know, it's almost becoming, you know, the standard connectivity uh, for a lot of companies. And we saw that in the study here where wireless connectivity was their first choice and they only really rigged somebody up, they only tethered somebody um, in the rare circumstance. So that Wi-Fi connection is becoming the predominant connection for end users and to the next point, IoT, end devices, those devices that are hanging off of your network. And there we're looking for more standards, more services, and all the things that you associate with uh, technology that's moving forward. Finally, success. And many of you are here because you're users of 7 Signal, but one of the things that stands out from the IRI study certainly is this orientation around the user experience. Again, it's nice to understand what, what's going on within the underpinnings of the network, because that's supporting the end user, but it's the end user view that matters most. It's how productive they are, kind of response and reliability, and the kind of readiness you're delivering to that end user as they demand more and more. Simplifying tool sets, techniques, and teamwork. You have faced it, and I'm sure you're facing it, even in your Wi-Fi environment. You, you probably you probably have Cisco Wi-Fi or Aruba Wi-Fi, Miss Wi-Fi. You probably, you know, there's a number of vendors that you have uh, that are your Wi-Fi vendors, and all of them offer tools. And many of you probably use some of their tools. Many of you have supplanted their tools and really replaced them with 7Signal. Maybe you're using them still as complements to one another but undoubtedly simplifying the tool set, simplifying the techniques associated with network management. And also, as I mentioned before, that teamwork that's necessary where the network staff are working with the security staff and are working with the, the application development team, again, to make sure that everything is coordinated because you've got a wealth of information that can really help those other teams. They just need to be able to accept it. And I understand that that is sometimes an organizational political um, you know, a struggle more so than a technical struggle, um, it, but that's breaking down. And certainly for C-level executives, they want that broken down completely. A proactive approach, be able to predict how the network is going, prepare yourself, do prescriptive management, understand where trends are moving. One of the great things with network analytics and this deeper visibility into networks is you can understand trends a lot more clearly. That allows you to operate with tighter resource uh, constraints. All of a sudden, instead of getting nervous when you know, a link reaches 60% or some device reaches 60 or 70% memory utilization or whatever, sudden, and all of a sudden you think, well, I better upgrade that device or get rid of it or replace it or whatever. The fact is, is that operating in tighter windows allows you to, again, use your resources more effectively and to better time the use of budget and resources to upgrade your network. As I said before, sharpen your network automation integration force focus. Many of you engineers in the audience have probably learned a lot about Puppet and Python and Ansible. You may be using a lot of these technologies to automate. Just be aware that there's a lot of tools out there that provide for automation that may be overlapping with what you're accomplishing. If you're writing so manifest that you know we'll reach out, grab some data, and provide you some information so that you can do some analysis. Just realize that data may be available already to you. It may be a subject of analysis by a tool you already have. So really sharpen your focus. Make sure you're complementing the tools that you have. And finally, share the wealth, data analysis, automation. You know, these are all bubbling up towards IT automation, not just network automation, not just security automation. So again, this feeds a greater good, all of this activity. I'll switch to the um, ROI portion now and talk about the impact. And you can see as you move to the left there, a lot of people will focus on more timely product problem resolution, being able to identify a problem quickly, being able to get to a root cause quickly, and then remedying the situation. And they'll also talk about resource optimization, again, operating in those tighter thresholds being able to go to 90% on something before you do the upgrade, 
uh, instead of having to go to 50 or 60 percent and having a lot of wasted space. I mean, that's the beauty of cloud services, let's face it, especially infrastructure as a service, where you can operate your servers to a very high extent and not have to spin up a new one until you're really up into the 90s of utilization because you could spin them up so fast. And so that's coming towards networking with the more details you have about how your network is operating. And on the strategic impact side, IT credibility, user satisfaction, these are all things that we saw come out very strongly in the ROI study. And these, are, these have strategic impacts on the business. You know, these are the people that you're serving. And IT credibility is critical here. You know, as that first slide points out, the demands relative to digital transformation certainly are very focused on the IT organization. And as you CIOs and C-level executives are associated with IT in the audience, you know that credibility is everything. When you go out and talk to the line of business managers, the business executives, under making sure that your systems, your underlying infrastructure are ready for that next step for them. And let's talk about the ROI study itself and go into some of the details here. Again, this is focused, this was focused on seven signal mobile eye customers. Some had Sapphire eye, but the focus was really on the mobile eye um, offering. And we had a series of qualitative and quantitative assessments, and we really looked at before and after. What were you doing before? What were your results before? And how did that change as a result of rolling mobile eye out to your users? And it rolled up all the costs, you know, so initial costs, things like training and such, the ongoing cost and deployment. You know, we tended to, you know, we see more deployment costs associated in the initial year than we do in the following year. So as a result, we factor that in, in terms of our cost structure. And again, big comp we went after bigger companies. So good sized populations in terms of employees and IT staff and a lot of different business applications. I'm sure you all look at the number of applications here and, and equate them to your own environment. Um, and and uh, this, is this is coming from the, the technology staff, the IT staff. So who knows about shadow IT? You know, you might be, uh, there might be another, might be a doubling of this if you really pull the entire organization. But again, good sized population of applications. And they, we cut across all industries. We had more healthcare than anybody. We really tried to get a representative view across industries so we could come up with good averages relative to what people were doing and the kind of returns they were making. In the system, I'll look at this from three perspectives in these three slides. One is on the system side, one is for the staff, and one is for the business, the user, and business and the user. In the system side, you know, downtime, slowdowns, again, with, when you see the numbers earlier in terms of the work from home population, you can imagine that has a pretty big impact when you look at anything relating to downtimes or slowdowns. And the ability to solve those that much faster, this is, this is all time that's given back to you. And also reduces the problems of finger pointing. Oh, it's not my problem, the network's fine, it's your problem, Mr. Security or your problem is application, or your problem, Mr. Data. You know, it avoids that finger, finger pointing issue. And that gets us to the root of the problem a lot faster. And also by optimizing network designs, even better is I like the bottom one the best, the reduced number of issues to troubleshoot. Because every troubleshooting exercise, you know, the user is involved. Maybe they have to make, you know, you have to make multiple calls with the user to determine what exactly is the problem. You want the user to send you some things. You want the user to do some things. All of that is very laborious for a user. And obviously trying to find the root cause, it moves up through some sort of hierarchy of, of troubleshooters. And then eventually, you know, the problem is figured out. And so reducing time associated with that drives great time savings for the staff as well as users. And so good designs, uh, improved deployment, improved, not only improved deployment times, but also the accuracy of deployments. You know, those are all things that enable, again, reduce the number of issues to troubleshoot. And also you start to have a smaller list of things to run through that could be a problem as you know, your design is proven, your deployment is very accurate. 
again, these are all things that allow your system to, again, have greater reliability, less downtime, less slowdowns, and also more ready for anything, which is very important when you're dropping on new applications at the speed digital demands these days. Staff impact. The staff impact is dramatic. I mean, this is firefighting, finger pointing, problem identification. Think of what you all would go through, went through before you had seven signal when a wireless user called in and they had a problem. I can't, you know, my applications are running slow. I can't get to this application. Uh, my network connection is down. You know, what are the things that are, you know, what are all the possibilities that you have to run through? Again, avoiding them is number one, and that's a great thing. But when they do pop up, the ability to get to them quickly, solve them, that goes to that earlier slide that I showed where it starts to attack those issues on the left side of the equation of responsibilities. It starts to relieve you of that burden. And again, every time, every bit of time saved allows you to be more effective um, in those strategic requirements. And this is not, I repeat, in the interviews we did, and no one reduced staff as a result of buying Seven Signal Mobileye. You know, that's not what this is about. It's not like, oh, I can, my full time impact is I went from this to this. You know, that saving translates to not less staff and less hiring, or even, you know, junior people replacing senior people. What that is, is that's over two full time equivalents relative to contributing to more strategic areas of the company. And again, it's all with a network experience. But it's also with that security mindset that you have to have as a networking person, again, making greater contribution and also building your own strength in terms of your career and the value to the organization. And that translates to you know, a premium for your salary. So again, this is not about you know, this is not about reducing staff. This is about redirecting staff and doing things that are more valuable. For the business and users, you know, small gains here produce tremendous gains in activity. So when you're looking at ROI and you look at you know, how many outages per year does somebody have? How many help desk calls are they making? We showed a survey earlier for work from home employees and the number of calls they made per week. They're making, I think the, the biggest number was they're making about five calls per week. You know, that's a significant amount of calls to have them involved in to cause a firefighting drill in the support staff, within the technical staff. And again, the amount of productivity saved as a result of not having to make those calls, not having to deal, because before a user makes the call, most users put up with a lot. And so they could be operating in a slowdown mode for a day or two before they even make the help desk call. Some may call the second something happens and they really shouldn't have called right away, but, you know, but, Again, helping them, you know, avoiding problems on the one hand is fantastic. It keeps them from calling you at all, from seeing any kind of decline in productivity, but also just reducing the number of times they call. And then when they call and when they report trouble, being able to not involve them in the process, being able to take it on your own because you've got a system that already supports and you can see because you've seen their experience and you can look at that and say, okay, I don't need to talk to them about their experience and what they're doing and what kind of drivers they have or anything like that. I've got a tool that allows me visibility into that. So again, the ability to keep those users productive, to help avoid problems, keep them from seeing it, keep them from experiencing them, that boosts credibility with IT, certainly boosts the connectivity that support that. And think of this also, this was focused in on actual end users. It was not focused in on IoT devices, those devices that are growing more and more popular within all kinds of industries, manufacturing, healthcare, retail, you name it. We're seeing more and more IT devices dropping every day onto networks. And pretty soon those IoT devices will outnumber end users. So with IoT and with the automated systems that they're driving, downtime for an IoT device can translate to just as much lost productivity and business and negative business impact as an end user being offline or an end user not being able to
do what they need to do. Think of an IoT device that wants to do some giant upload at the end of the day, or is updating real-time information constantly. You know, what's the price of that device suddenly go off, suddenly going offline, or being restricted in terms of how much they can download? That's a dramatic impact on the business and on the end users and those endpoints. And with that, I'll draw it to a close. I'm sorry, I didn't have a clock in front of me, but I'm sure I spoke longer than I should have. But uh, I guess I think I moved this to a Q&A with Jim, as I recall. Thanks, Mark. Uh, excellent job as always, just uh, fascinating data that you and your team pulled together. And you're right, uh, Jim Vada is gonna moderate the, the um, Q&A portion for you, Mark. So I'm gonna hand it over to him in just a minute. But while everyone's formulating some questions, I've got two more polls that we're going to ask the audience. And the first is around um, your, uh, your, your title. We're kind of, we're curious who's joining us today. And um, uh, we've got the poll question there pulled up for you. So we'll show the results in just a minute. My preference is to uh, select the bottom one. I kind of do everything in this place. Probably Jim would select that. Tom and Kelsey would probably pick that one too. Yeah, in a small company, that's how it is, isn't it? Right, right. So we'll just give that a second or two. So we've got uh, majority engineers, 52%, uh, and, a, and almost an equal spread of, of C, administrator, director, consultants, and a nice 13% number there. I do everything in this place. <laughs> Uh, very funny. So uh, let's pull up one more while you guys are formulating those questions for Mark. And, and that is around trade shows. So uh, me being in marketing, I'm curious to know if you plan on attending a trade show in person. And of course, that has a lot to do with if the events are happening in person. So assuming that there is an in-person event, would you go and attend? Um, there's a lot of events out there, not only in, in, in this uh this industry, but also specific to different verticals. So I'm curious to know what everyone is thinking in the audience. I'd sure love to, Don. I mean, I'm really uh, experiencing WLPC withdrawal this oh, week. Oh yeah, so. <laughs> such a great event. All right, let's see if we can pull those results up. Uh, so we've got an interesting balance here, almost 30% across the board, a little bit less on the yes side, a little surprising. A lot of folks in the not sure category, 39%. Very interesting. But I think we're 100% at this at this table, right? Yes. I think we're, we're interested in going to an event. Um, so, Jim, I'll, I'll hand it over to you and let's get into some Q&A for Mark. Thanks, Don. And, and thanks, Mark, for the presentation. That was really insightful. Uh, a couple two, uh, key takeaways for me, you know, particularly thinking about my experience as a wireless network engineer. You know, there's a real opportunity here to do more with less and uh, particularly with troubleshooting activities and wireless networking. Uh, normally it's a very hands-on process. You've got boots on the ground. It's an hours or days long process for something that's an advanced issue. And productivity gains there are really going to pay off. Um, and that has all these second order effects. If you've got your wireless engineers and network team spending less time troubleshooting, now they've got more time for that big long list of projects that's waiting for them that has its own set of deadlines and requirements. And um, you know, any, any project management team is gonna be happy to have more hours available from uh, high scale network engineers. So very cool. Uh, okay, Mark, so uh, while the audience is still putting together their questions, I I've got one for you. Um, how does our R ROI stack up compared to other mo monitoring solutions that you've researched? Uh, uh, the seventh signal ROI is 10 times higher than I've ever seen. No, I'm only kidding, Jim. <laughs> I would say it's higher than normal. Um, you know, we do, we've done these projects for the last 10 or 15 years in a variety of technologies and such. And I would say it's higher than normal. Uh, the payback is, is faster than most that I've seen. And I, you know, you think about that and you think about, well, why that is. Um, and, I, and I think that if I look at ones that, are le that provide uh, slower ROIs or less impactful ROIs, 
Um, I think there's a number of contributing factors to that that aid seven signals ROI results is one thing you're subscription based. So, you know, that is a major attraction for companies. They're able to build, they're able to buy just what they need. So instead of maybe, you know, over, you know, doing, you're buying too many big things or investing too much or buying things that they don't use or something. The ability to, again, zero in on just spending money on what they need is very, very key for people in terms of, you know, matching up and optimizing their ROI results. The other thing is, is that with your product, and again, this is a significant advantage for ROI, is the wider impact of your product. I showed a slide earlier that has all the different ways that network analytics and automation can have a positive impact in different areas of the company, moving from the tacticals to the strategic. And you mentioned one too, staff, less time firefighting, more time doing high value uh, tasks. And I think that wide impact zone really helps out because it allows you to deliver benefits, hard benefits, across more places than the average one that we see that, that you know, sites that uh, technologies that, you know, they may not have as much of an impact on design or troubleshooting or speed of rollouts or uh, staff impact or user impact. And as I highlight on the user slide, you know, small gains in user productivity translate to very high returns because you've just got a very large population. As, and as you saw with the demographics of this study, uh, you know, the number of employees in those companies that we were surveying, you know, very large population of employees. And as a result, small gains in productivity, if you, you gain an hour a week for them. And as we saw by the stats on, you know, work from home employees and reporting problems, you know, if you're reporting five problems a week, as a wireless work from home user, you know, that's, you know, that's a lot of productivity lost. So again, I think the wide impact of there and the, and to reinforce that point, the user proximity, you know, the ability to understand the user experience. And again, that just excel, all of a sudden you move from just being, you know, delivering a reliable system or a system that's easy to troubleshoot, or you save your staff some time in troubleshooting, suddenly, you know, you really ramp up the curve in terms of returns to the business and driving better business outcomes through two things really there. One, you make that user more productive. And that's a great thing. And small gains translate to big returns. But even more so, and almost more, as, certainly as important, is you're driving up the credibility of IT. And in this world of digital transformation, IT stands at the center of it. When, you, when your CIO is speaking to the CEO or your directors are speaking with line of business managers, um, you know, they've got to have credibility. They've got to be able to convince people that they're going to do what is required and that their infrastructure is ready for anything they can come up with. And digital is about being nimble. It's about being able to try things very quickly and obviously leveraging all of your underlying technology to the greatest extent possible. And when you have credibility with the business, again, that makes people try even more things and to come to you for even more things. And that's a good thing, especially if you freed up some time from fighting you know, fires and doing all the tactical duties associated with network management, suddenly you're able to respond to those things positively instead of just looking at it as, oh, add, add another project to the list of projects that I don't have the time to get to. You know, that's, a, that's a very difficult thing. And being responsive is part of that credibility aspect for the IT organization. Mark, and uh, I think we can uh, go to some customer Q&A. Yep. Uh, once again, what we'd like to ask anybody that has a question, go ahead and drop it in the Q&A panel. Uh, we've got one here from Tim who says, are there any automation tools that work best with network gear? Ansible seems to be a great multi-use items. Are there others that, that are used effectively on-prem or for cloud networking? Yep. So Mark, any IDC take on that? Uh, sure, sure. 
Uh, you know, there there are, and and I'll speak to this as a as for broad based automation tools. I know Seven Signal has some automation function within their solution, but in terms of broad based networking tools, um, you know, you're seeing some activity within the larger networking equipment vendors, the intent based networking solutions out of Cisco and so forth. But for bang for the buck and advanced features, um, I'd highlight two companies. One is Itential, small i, capital T, Itential. Um, the other one is Glueware, G-L-U-W-A-R-E. Uh, those, I'll just give you those two. Uh, Glueware, um, I think, is probably the most interesting of the two, uh, just because of their uh, what the kind of out there output they're presenting to you and the ease with which uh, you can construct, uh, shall we say, network programs. Again, you're not using Ansible as a tool that a lot of people have taken their first strides in automation. They use a lot of Ansible, very reliable and such, but it, it is still clumsy. It still requires a lot of understanding and expertise. And, and, and you know, there's a managing component that's just not there with Ansible. If somebody writes an Ansible, you know, you know you know, program and suddenly, you know, they, you know, somebody else could be writing someone, another one somewhere else in the organization, they may conflict, who knows? So process is a very important thing with automation. So I would say Glueware is an interesting one to look at. They have some very large network implementations. They work across the network. They are multi-vendor. So it doesn't matter if you have Juniper routers and Cisco switches and things like that. That's very key. Itential is a real great script aid. It provides a very nice interface for defining um, more advanced scripts. And for those of you who are doing a lot of scripting and are trying to manage that and are trying to push them out in a faster manner and a more organized manner, then Itential you know, could be a good product to look at. And they, they come at things from a little different angle, but again, if you're big into scripting and you're looking to speed that process, Itential, if you uh, want to have a more complete view of, of automation and taking network automation to the next level um, and moving beyond scripts, uh, then I would say Glueware is an interesting one to look at. There are some others, but those two jump out off the top of my head. Uh, really pleased to introduce Rocky Gregory. He's the Global Enterprise Wireless Architect at Nike. And Shannon Kurtz from the CIO office at IBM. She's responsible for their campus WLAN supporting hundreds of IBM sites globally. Uh, so thanks for joining us uh, today, guys. And uh, Rocky, if you're ready, let's start with you. Are you there, Rocky? I'm here. Excellent. So uh, Rocky, you and your team have been Nike customers uh, using Mobileye and Sapphire for over a year now. So what have your takeaways been in terms of the business value you've been able to get out of our solutions? Yeah, I think there have been a few. Um, one that, that was mentioned a few times already that Mark went into, um, mean time to repair. So, um, you know, we have um, a staff responsible for um, a multitude of different environments, any environment you can imagine, um, distribution, carpeted space, retail, and having that kind of visibility that um, we can't get asking an end user, um, that we can't really do the interactive troubleshooting with someone on a retail floor, um, and we can't get to our campus right now. So as we um, were doing a campus refresh for um, the infrastructure that supports about 22,000 users a day, and we're doing it without people on site. So um, we've been able to really leverage the Sapphire eyes and take a look at the optimization that we can do um, to, to kind of make it the best network it can be without um, having end user feedback. So that's been a huge value. Um, again, that mean time to repair, um, you know, I think I picked it up from Keith Parsons somewhere along the line that most wireless issues aren't. So having visibility into stuff like DNS, DHCP, um, we had what looked to be a, a connectivity issue uh, in our newly refreshed buildings as part of our WHQ refresh and found pretty quickly that it was DHCP. 
So it looked like wireless. It's the first thing to blame. Um, but it, it gave us that quick visibility so that we could, um, you know, more quickly get to the root cause analysis. So kind of across the entire environment, we've been able to use um, the seven signal products both um, practically. Um, so we've got an issue with robots that are misbehaving. We can ship a Sapphire Eye, um, get some quick visibility, or, you know, load mobile eye onto a handheld, have someone go do a walk of the environment. And then strategically, as we look at the WHQ refresh, being able to look at our metrics and stare at those metrics and figure out, you know, what optimizations we can make. I don't know, kind of a roundabout answer. I hope that hit it though. Mean time to repair really resonates. I, I like to talk yes. about mean time to innocence. Right. Because like right. you said, so many issues really are not Wi Fi issues, yeah. not issues between uh, those 802.11 radios, but some, some other uh, related service on the network having an issue. Exactly. Yeah. Mean time to blame. <laughs> so, Rocky, did uh, what you heard from the IDC report from Mark, did that match some of what you guys have found? It did. It does resonate pretty well. Um, you know, I certainly have not reduced staff, um, but I'm able to have staff be more um, efficient with their time. So when ticket handling time goes down, it means project time goes up and projects don't go away, they just keep getting piled on. So we've got a pretty significant backlog and the more tools that I can give my team to quickly diagnose issues or to get out in front of issues, the more time we've got to dedicate to projects. So um, it, it does lower the overall handling time um, and help with those efforts that are more strategic for the group. Great, thanks, Rocky. Yeah. And Shannon, if you're there, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, Shannon. So you participated in the IDC study. Did your team at IBM have similar findings? Oh, uh, definitely. So, you know, uh, the mean time to repair and the mean time to innocence that was mentioned, um, for the meantime, the innocence, that was actually how we got started with 7Signal, is uh, a few years back, uh, we really focused on 100% Wi-Fi coverage. That's the primary means of connectivity. We've even been disabling our Ethernet ports so that it's the only form of, of connectivity. And uh, we actually had uh, some people out in San Francisco from an acquisition that were using Google Hangouts, which was not our normal um, software that we use for voice services and complained about the awful experience. And I felt that it was with the internet egress and nothing with Wi-Fi, but their perspective is it must be Wi-Fi because that's what I connect with. And we had customers that basically refused to help us troubleshoot and said, you know what, you should really be able to find this without us answering any of your questions. We won't run any of the scripts that you want us to run on our machines, you go figure it out. And that was actually when I started looking across uh, the marketplace for, you know, who has a client agent that I can deploy on a client machine to, uh, to collect information. And then not only that, but be able to deploy sensors to have more permanently um, for the entire location. And basically that's what allowed us to finally prove what what we had thought is that it was actually an internet link and not Wi-Fi, but then we said, you know, we really need to, um, to make this available uh, more broadly. And, and since then, it really has, um, well, first of all, it actually helped us identify other issues we didn't even know existed because people weren't complaining yet, or it was just the missing VLANs that Rocky mentioned in, in Nike. Well, if you have a missing VLAN, it's not affecting everybody. It's really annoying people, but they're not down. And so you really have disgruntled customer base, but you've not been able to pinpoint it. And so uh, deploying the sensors around where we could get information from lots of different sites actually surfaced all of these things we didn't realize were happening. 
people weren't complaining, but it was certainly a miserable experience for them. And we were able to, to fix. And it was things like, uh, you know, the missing VLANs, or maybe there was a typo made. Uh, maybe it was authentication services where you have five servers, but one of them's not working, the other four are, uh, and, and you get that working again. Uh, some were five gigahertz coverage holes where uh, we went back and said, gee, this survey wasn't very good to begin with. Let's go, you know, add some more uh, access points. And so in being able to find and fix those issues before uh, people complained or without them complaining, um, then we could get our people to, instead of focusing on support issues because there were things that were broken out there, we fixed them all so that we could then focus on other things, more strategic things like Rocky said, like, you know, let's stop uh, spending so much of our time on problem fix or interacting with clients, playing 20 questions with them before you can work on their issues to, hey, let's focus more on automation and analytics to improve uh, our service as a whole and do more strategic things, uh, architectural enhancements instead of all these individual issues because we were able to find them and fix them um, without having to handle them with individual customer complaints. Uh, so the return on investment is that we spend a lot less time on troubleshooting and repair, and we spend much more time on furthering our strategic initiatives and enhancing uh, the architecture as a whole. Uh, the other thing I, I just wanted to point out is aside from uh, problems with our architecture or our configurations or, you know, where maybe our surveys weren't great. Uh, we also used it to identify code bugs with Cisco. And in fact, we would run into a code bug and Cisco would say, oh, no, it must be something wrong with your environment. We also have uh, AT&T that provides our network support. Uh, so that when we had issues, you'd have AT&T point at Cisco, Cisco point at AT&T, sometimes get pointed back at us saying, oh, you probably don't, didn't do a good survey. Uh, and so uh, having this data allowed us to provide proof, wait a second, uh, Cisco, it is changing from 20 megahertz to 40 megahertz, even though you didn't log it anywhere and you don't seem to have the capability to tell it, I've got this real evidence to prove what I'm saying. And so then they had to go, oh, oh, this is our problem. <laughs> now we do uh, need to fix it. Um, we also found client driver bugs where we had older Apple devices uh, in which they were not keeping up with the pace of new five gigahertz channels that countries were uh, allowing. And so basically, you know, the, they would say, well, it's Wi-Fi. Um, that goes out, and then you actually are like, well, no, wait a second, you know, you're not able to connect to this one channel the country allows, that's your device. And so uh, we've also used it to prove uh, issues with other vendors and, and having to resolve that, because at the end of the day, all the client sees is I can't connect to Wi-Fi, it must be a Wi-Fi issue. Um, so we just have a wide range of examples in which um, it's helped us uh, to find issues either ahead of time or just being able to speed up, here's where the problem is so that we can work with that other group to actually fix it. Yeah, Shannon, you brought up a lot of uh, important points there. Certainly when working with an AP vendor to try to establish that there's a software bug or a hardware issue with an AP, that can be really challenging. You might have to provide over-the-air packet captures and you know, do continuous monitoring to be able to discover something that's an intermittent issue. And, you know, having the right tools in place can really make that an easier process. Um, another point I thought was interesting, and I think a lot of our customers have this experience too, is uh, with Mobileye and Sapphire deployed, they start discovering, you know, smaller issues that cause some, you know, pain and grief for end users, but they haven't quite crossed that threshold yet where they're going to call the help desk and, you know, be willing to engage in, in that process of troubleshooting with the help desk. So you might discover issues you didn't know were there that people are just simply tolerating and, and be able to get those resolved um, uh, for everyone's benefit. 
Shannon, I wanted to follow up though. Interesting uh, point during Mark's presentation about automation tools. You shared uh, what you guys are doing with Ansible. So would you mind maybe sharing that live? Um, well, so um, I guess I don't have anything I can really uh, share to the screen right now, but yeah. with our focus on the, the, the automation um, and the analytics is, so we've created a very large, it's uh, well, nine or 10 terabytes now, where we are actually trying to collect information from all of our tools and stored in a database so that we can analyze it to identify issues. We build some of our own health dashboards or some of our own, own rules um, to alert us. And so we're using Ansible for a couple of things. One is we want to log into all of our devices and collect some information about those, um, about those devices. So, you know, one is, hey, uh, if somebody, if security came to us and said, there's a suspicious, uh, device, here's the MAC address or IP, we can go back and tell all the different places um, that it was connected to uh, in our network. We also want to start storing and backing up our configurations so that we can start analyzing all of them to make sure they all comply with the global template uh, because we are very much into standard global templates. Uh, and so the first step is collecting all of those, making sure things comply. And then what we want to use Ansible for is now every time there's a new deployment, let's take the standard template, let's take these variables that are specific to that site or country or region to put into that template to then push the config to the device. And well, we use um, mainly Cisco in the campus. And now that they have iOS XE out, uh, it allows you to do that automated config, whereas the, the previous iOS was very proprietary and very difficult with Ansible for lots of different reasons. It was just made it very difficult. Uh, so that we have iOS XC, uh, we're going to be able to do that. So we're looking uh, first to do that with Ansible because previous to that, we had looked at scripting it a few different ways. And Ansible just has so many playbooks already developed by other people out there that you can pretty much find where somebody else has done what you're trying to do. Uh, and then you just kind of manipulate it for, uh, for what you need. Now, one of the things with being a Cisco shop is we are still figuring out how that's going to integrate with DNA because Cisco is going to tell you, oh, use DNA for full automated config management. But we've kind of learned from the past is you've got to be careful of how much you rely on something proprietary and you're so dependent on that vendor. So my preference is, Let's use Ansible playbooks in our database, but we can use perhaps DNA as the vehicle because I know a lot of the Cisco products, like with the previous Prime, it's kind of a database under the covers you can't get to. And we very much need to store things in a database we can access because then we can extract it from that database as we write more AI uh, and automation and tooling. Now, we are a big, uh, you know, IBM big with AI. So not every company is going to want to build their own database and, and do all of this. So, you know, I think there's probably different products to fit, uh, you know, different categories and groups. Uh, but because we do have our own database we're developing and a lot of our own AI on top of that, it's important to us uh, to have that capability um, to extract and, and store that in our own database and not in, um, you know, another vendor's product. Uh, so then the key is around the integration and the APIs. And so that's another thing with, with 7Signal and Mobileye we've been talking uh, with 7Signal uh, about is, hey, um, you guys also offer APIs because eventually there's some data for Mobileye and, and from Sapphire that I'm also going to want to store in that database so that I can compare it to other things to even you know, alert me a, ahead of time um, to when there's potential issues. And so 7Signal has that capability and it's kind of on our to-do list to look at next to start pulling into that database. Yeah, Shannon and Rocky, this is Mark here. I'm, I'm always, you know, and, and it's very easy to get wrapped up in the technology here. And, and, you know, these solutions offer us so much leverage to better run our networks and such. I'm very interested on, this, on the services side of the fence and what suppliers do besides just provide you 
technology solutions is you know when you look at your own implementation and where you are and, and even even onboarding originally to where you are now and trying to do even more things with the seven signal product um, and you'll see a roadmap uh, next I, I, I hear from Simon as well so from that standpoint what are the what are the service related things that seven signal do that really help you move faster um, you know leverage their product even more so than what you would than what you would uh, do on your own. And I know that networking people are highly self-reliant as you heard by the examples with Shannon doing a lot of Ansible work and their own database and all that stuff. But you know, the kind of things that Seven Signal have done to help you along the way. I think kind of the ongoing training of, of my team has been just out of this world. Um, I've got a, a primary person who works with Seven Signal um, I needed depth of coverage, so we had to bring another engineer up to speed and um, just seven signals willingness to get on the phone and do individualized training and um, in those trainings, um, it's not just here's how you use the tool, but it's been kind of augmenting the overall wireless training, um, you know, an issue was brought up of um, a bunch of channel changes going on because of what could be a Cisco bug or could be a Cisco feature, depending on who you ask. Um, and, you know, rather than um, just kind of pointing out, here's where you would find channel changes, um, the, the seven signal rep said, okay, this may be a concern, you're seeing this, and pointed out an issue that may have gone unnoticed. So, um, you know, there's, there's that piece where um, it's, it's coaching on the overall technology that my staff is getting beyond just the tool that we use to monitor that technology. And further are those webinars are just absolutely powerful. Um, they're not sales pitches. Um, my team, um, I encourage them to join them when they can. And um, that I think speaks to their overall commitment to people in the industry, not just customers in the industry. Um, so it, I've been overwhelmed with, um, overjoyed with the support that we've gotten kind of, even though we've, we've you know, gotten to the point where we've done our major purchase, we've done our, um, we've started our deployments, we've got our deployments rolling, we're still getting this ongoing handholding in the care and feeding and training. Shannon, yeah, Shannon. So we, we, Go ahead, yeah, so we were the same thing. The coaching on technology uh, is a good one. Um, you know, with the the the, uh, the dashboards, if there's something where something doesn't look right, and we're not sure how to interpret it, uh, or want some ideas. Um, uh, the sales engineer, uh, the, the the systems engineers have helped us. And well, here's the possible things, or you know, here's us looking at the data, uh, what we think. Uh, and helping our train our people on, on how to understand those. Um, and then I also have to tell you that Seven Signal has been very receptive when we've come to them saying, hey, if you added this feature or you collected this other piece of data, it would really help us. Or, hey, you know, we really need SSO into your uh, dashboard. And so they've been very receptive um, and incorporated, uh, you know, quite a few of the things we asked for. Uh, into their newer releases that doesn't just benefit us, but that's one thing is they do look and say, well, gee, this could actually benefit everybody. And then they've taken things even 10 steps beyond what we suggested. And when they looked into it, said, oh, and if we did that and that and that. Um, so uh, they've also been very receptive into that. The webinars uh, have been wonderful. Um, and uh, and also just tying in, you know, now the sensor information and the uh, the mobile eye agent information and, and taking that further. Because at the end of the day, we have all these other tools that tell us information, but they don't give us the end user experience. And really with the seven signal tools, this is the only way to understand and measure the end user experience without having to talk to each end user individually. Um, and so translating, you know, that experience into, okay, uh, what does that mean? Um, 
what could be the areas in our network that be, could be contributing to that. Um, they've helped us greatly in understanding and tying everything together. Yeah, thanks, Thank Shannon. You. And I uh, real, really appreciate both Rocky and Shannon uh, mentioning our customer success and support teams. They really do a great job. Appreciate that. Uh, why don't we transition to a, a question more around budgets? So why don't we start with you, Rocky? How are you justifying uh, the seven signal spend in your, your budget at Nike? It's a really good question. Um, so a lot of, um, since wireless problems can be so nebulous and it's the most visible, invisible thing in the network, um, we can get a really bad rap about our ticket handling time um, and about nagging issues. And um, really we've justified, especially in our um, HQ campus um, refresh, the justification has been, we're going to proactively know when there are issues rather than waiting for the phone to ring. So um, we can reduce that ticket handling time significantly by knowing the issue exists, um, hopefully before end users do and before we get that phone call. So that's been, um, you know, kind of pain that we felt historically and having um, an antidote for it has been the biggest um, justification that we've been able to, to come up with and it's work. Um, getting the, the client side view as well as the network side view. So um, keeping the network honest um, has been a, a big selling point internally to get that budget. Yeah, and Shannon, what's your experience uh, been like with budgeting? Yep, so, um, so usually ours is we have to kind of get the regional buy-in. So, you know, we deployed it at the first few locations and that's where we uncovered all kinds of things we didn't know what were going on. So it was like, yep, this was a great investment. Uh, now we need to deploy this across all of our regions. And so we had quite a few regions that were like, well, why, do, why does money need to come out of my budget for this? Maybe I don't want this in my region. And that's when we've actually been keeping a PowerPoint presentation of every time we find a problem, we do screen captures, describe what the problem was and plop it in this presentation. So every time a region would say, why do I need this? I'm like, well, let us show you. Hey, look, we had this problem. We could see it on the dashboard. We fixed it all without a customer complaining hey, look at this very complicated problem. And then within 30 minutes of looking at the data, we were able to pinpoint it. So we were able to give them real world examples. And then on top of that, we've also said, we're now gonna have a uh, pilot code program where anytime we certify new Wi-Fi code, which everybody does have to adopt within three months, um, we will have a pilot period if you want a site to participate in that pilot period so you can see it works no problem, you have to have sensors there so that, in that during that pilot, we apply the new code, we look at the sensor data so we can tell you, look, we applied it in your region um, from an end user perspective, no problem. And we tell them they do have to have a few sites in each region as part of this pilot program. And so, uh, seven signal has to be a part of that. And then also if they want advanced support from our teams, because you have your level one, level two help desk or whatever. If they want advanced support from our team in key locations, like there's manufacturing, or maybe there's a giant customer briefing center, or you have lots of executives sit, we basically tell them, uh, you have to have these sensors there so that we have the data at our fingertips. We have historical data. We can see trends. We can see what's going on. And then if you have problems, you have our advanced uh, support group that can step in and, and look and evaluate. And so when we share all of that with them, uh, they'll buy in and say, oh, I can see you show me demonstrated examples. And I now have the comfort of I have this data in which I'm going to have really smart people you know, be able to look at it, experience people, and, and tell me if my site is, is healthy or not in pinpoint. Yeah, great. That's an excellent way to help make that business case. So, Rocky, question for you, and 
And Shannon, I'd love to hear your input on this too, but how has Seven Signal continued to play a role through the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, is this part of your largest or larger business continuity plan? And is remote work uh, at Nike and at IBM um, here to stay? I, you know, it's interesting <laughs> and probably not the best answer, but um, Nike doesn't actually provide support to home users networks. Um, so uh, we, you know, our agents go, the, the mobile eye agents go on the machines of the people who are actually at the office. But the opposite is what's been of value to me, which is that our campus goes into complete lockdown where only essential staff are allowed. Um, some of those essential staff are tabling vendors helping us get our, our refresh done. So the, the value has been for my team to be able to go in and look at sensors as we bring up a new building and see how that building's behaving when they can't get to the campus. So um, it's it's been kind of the opposite of what I think people expect the value to be in that we don't support those home users, but my engineering staff at home are getting visibility trending um, data on how the new network is performing without having to go into the giant campus and, and the hot zone that it could be if we had an infection. Yeah, and Shannon? Yeah, so for us, so, um, so we don't support the uh, people's home network, but because there have been less people on site, we've actually been using this period to try to accelerate certifying new platforms. So we've been certifying the new Wi-Fi 6 access points, the embedded wireless controller functionality, the new iOS XE code. So the, the sensors have been great because we can't have as many people on site doing the testing. We have a few people that can go on site. So it's like, hey, this site hardly anyone's going at. Let's go upgrade the new code. Let's put these new platforms in. And then from home, as we apply new code and settings, we can look at the, the net effect so that what we're trying to do is this period in which people aren't home is let's make the Wi-Fi even better. So when they do come back, and I think they, they will come back, that it's better than when they left it. And now we also have more capabilities. Now, I think when people do come back, it may not be as concentrated, but the thing with Wi-Fi is you still have to have complete coverage you maybe don't need to have as dense access points, but we still need to provide the same coverage footprint. Uh, and so again, those measurements from the end user expect, uh, perspective are gonna help us figure out, uh, do we have it right? Or are there some places we need to go fix? Um, and we've also uh, been using this to test new settings and, and new code, which leads us to other places. Uh, and, um, even though there may be some places people don't return, your manufacturing, that's still gonna happen. We're still gonna have large customer briefing centers. So it's also focusing this work in the areas in which we know there will be uh, continued work going on. And, and by the way, we're already seeing the people return to the site uh, in Asia PAC, because we do measure that quite closely with our analytics. So we know all the sites people are returning to, and we're already seeing that in Asia PAC, we're seeing that some in uh, the Nordic countries as well, um, and and as they do, we're you know also using having to use some of the mobile eye and some of the sensors we just send around to problem areas uh, to troubleshoot as they return. Yeah, Shannon, I think that's a pretty common uh, customer experience. At least that's some of the feedback I've heard. Uh, buildings are empty, sites are available, so this is a great time to do AP refreshes hardware refreshes, you know, take maintenance windows during normal business hours and, and get things upgraded and uh, installed uh, before people start coming back. Yeah. Um, uh, next question, and I'd, Mark, I'd, I'd love to hear your input on this one um, in general for, for what you're hearing around uh, the industry, but uh, we'll, we'll ask Shannon and Rocky this as well. But what's Seven Signals' role in the larger infrastructure plans for 2021 and beyond? 
we've heard from IDC and others that spending is being diverted from refreshing and expansion to productivity and monitoring. So Mark, any um, comment before we go to uh, Shannon and Rocky? Uh, yeah, I, I found it, uh, I liked, uh, I'll liken it to Shannon's experience that she's doing, the concentration on finding out a lot more about what's going on in her network. And I, I liked, uh, you, you, you talked about this movement where you know, you're seeing AP tick up in terms of activity on the network. So you know, that's like an indication of you know, how that visibility can really affect how you operate. And obviously everyone, you know, as much as bad as COVID has been, uh, for a lot of folks, you know, there are some advantages to it. The buildings are empty. It is time to upgrade. It is time to do things. And obviously, if you're freeing up people from having to diagnose work from home problems, suddenly they can look at new technologies and do upgrades and optimize the existing network. You know, these are all significant advantages that pay a lot of dividends down the road. And uh, you know, those are things that I must say, even in our ROI studies, you know, those are more some of the softer justifications that you hear from people that they may not have data, you know, they don't have data on how does that, you know, how does that make the business more nimble? Because there isn't a return yet for it. But undoubtedly in this digital world, you know, being successful is about being nimble and being ready and being able to um, adopt new applications onto your network at a moment's notice without generating suddenly a lot more trouble tickets and things. So, you know, people don't put a price on that, but that is a major gain if, again, your network is far more ready to do things. And that has to do with you know, infrastructure spending as well. I mean, and you look at a lot of the new infrastructure spending, a lot of people were doing the same old, same old prior to COVID. And they're realizing that networks need to be far more dynamic and elastic. And that's leading them to examine more of the technologies that allow for greater flexibility and elasticity. Uh, I talked about the cloud uptick that we're seeing from people, but also you know, that movement towards a more mobile workforce and emphasis on Wi-Fi. You know, are we going to, in new sites, are we going to run the LAN switch anymore and run a wire to everyone's desktop, uh, everyone's desk space? Well, the reality is, does anyone have a desk space anymore? I mean, I mean, these are all things that are to be worked out. Um, you know, one of one of the the subjects of our study was a major office uh, manufacturer, major office furniture manufacturer, and they have all kinds of different layouts for customers to view in terms of how they want their offices to look like. And in there, it was all about wireless. You know, no one's worried about you know running cables to every every place. And so from that perspective, Wi-Fi is the dominant connectivity. So that becomes a major factor in terms of AP capacities and, and surveys and how you're laying things out and contention across wireless and security, uh, segmentation. I mean, all of those things start to pop up as wireless becomes the dominant uh, structure that we're connecting to. And that has a lot to do with you know, new technologies like like a 5G, where we're seeing a lot of activity, especially in the service provider space. And this is causing the service providers to be a lot more aware of what's running across their network. You know, they've been looking for ways of adding value besides just selling bandwidth and circuits forever and ever. But those bandwidth and circuits were fairly staid and static, and they ran from point A to point B. And so they were pretty easy to kind of keep track of. And, and hey, you ran just, you know, that's why we ran all that dark fiber. So it's easy to just turn some new ones on. Well, in the 5G world, it's very different in terms of network designs and the things you have to worry about, capacity planning. And again, being able, and service providers are always looking to add value on top of selling bandwidth or even wireless connections. So from that perspective, service providers are really investing a lot in analytics and trying to understand again how the networks are running and what they what, how they can monetize the services that they're presenting to end users and remember 5g is not only something that's being uh, promoted as a wide area network component it is also being promoted as a local area network environment as well so from that perspective a lot of those things that apply in a wi-fi wi-fi 6 environment older Wi-Fi environment, those things are going to translate into the private 5G networks. And they will also translate across the larger spectrum in the wide area network for 5G as well. 
and SD-WAN is another technology that I think of with the flexibility that it provides for remote branches. Maybe it's a remote branch of one. Uh, when we do maybe roll out enterprise networking gear into people's homes, you saw some announcements by Spectrum and Cisco recently where they're offering a package where somebody gets a Cisco device that's basically a corporate device that they're putting inside of their home network. And the flexibility of SD-WAN products, the whole issue of being software defined enables that product and that technology to be more flexible. That has to be driven by data and analytics and all those decisions that are made as a result of that to form the, the SD-WAN so that it's performing up to snuff depending on what the user's requirements are in, that, any, in those locations. Thanks, Mark. And why don't we go to Rocky here? So Rocky, what uh, where do you see Seven Signal fitting into Nike's larger infrastructure plans going forward? Yeah, I think that the buzzword um, right now, at least at Nike, but I think industry wide is observability, right? We need to be able to have instrumentation in all of our environments that gives us a holistic view. And for Nike, um, the wireless infrastructure continues to become more and more critical. So um, we're, you know, refreshing our world headquarters, but at the same time, we're doing a complete refresh of technologies at our Asia headquarters and our Europe headquarters. And Seven Signal is critical to the success of those two pieces. And is quickly becoming critical infrastructure for us. So without that observability and instrumentation, um, we extend that mean time to blame. Um, and so it's, it's key for success of those new refreshes. And, you know, it's becoming key infrastructure um, for the, the places that I don't have bodies. So our distribution centers, um, it's going to become key infrastructure there for us to be able to, um, when I can't send someone out with a spectrum analyzer and I can't send someone out with Ekahau and I can't um, send someone out to stand on the floor and do throughput testing, um, it's going to become really key to that infrastructure um, going forward to be able to have that remote observability. Thanks, Rocky. How about you, Shannon? Yes, so both uh, uh, Mark and Rocky uh, touched on a few things, uh, the same as that, uh, the, SD, the SDN, the software defined networking. So, um, you know, I mentioned before, we have these pilot sites with, we test new code upgrades, but as we move to SD, SDN, which we are in the WAN and campus, we're going to get to the point that we're going to just start making changes at a push of a button a lot more frequently. And we really need, and we're not going to have to schedule up on-site testers every time. So that's where it's really important that when we make a change, what data do we have from the site, from the end user experience that confirms whatever we just did didn't negatively impact it, especially when these changes as we're more agile are gonna be more frequent, smaller changes more frequent instead of where we came from our old waterfall method where once a year we'd apply new code and a, you know, whatever template updates. Um, so SDN bringing around this, bringing about those more frequent changes really relies on what do you have out there uh, that gives you immediate data feedback on whether it was successful or not. Uh, and then also with the mention of 5G, um, you know, we, uh, real estate and security are starting to use a lot of other technologies uh, for IoT devices. And so they're wanting to deploy a lot more of their endpoints uh, on different networks. And we need to make sure that those don't interfere. And in fact, we found at some sites where I think it was Zigbee, since it uses some of the 2.4, that we were actually seeing interference. And it was probably us interfering with theirs, but they need their network up and running as well. And so as uh, IoT becomes uh, more predominant and there's more IoT devices, it's, you know, how do you assess the health of everything and even help other people uh, that you might be impacting uh, their network as well to share information. 
um, the analytics and automation, that the APIs and pulling data so we can do more analytics. Uh, that's key for us uh, as we move into 2021. Oh, as uh, Wi-Fi 6E comes about um, with more channels, we're apt to run into problems again where, hey, this country allows more channels. We now support more channels. Uh, if there's clients having problems connecting, maybe it's their device driver or something like that. So with Wi-Fi 6E, uh, we'll probably be relying quite a bit on, on the data we get uh, from the sensors and then from the mobile eye agents. And then we've also been talking to 7Signal about, hey, we've been using the mobile eye agent to look at one specific user's uh, information and data to maybe troubleshoot. But what we actually want to do is start silently pushing the client in an anonymized fashion to feed us data so that we can see general trends. So, hey, uh, are we seeing Apple notebooks um, with a, a certain driver or adapter that maybe their performance isn't as great or when they release whatever their new OS level is, you know, we're seeing their MCI index go down or, or something like that. Uh, so that's something else we're looking to do is how do we deploy the mobile eye agent across a larger scale of client machines just to tell us trends uh, versus, you know, individual uh, client information. So that's another focus for us in, in 2021. Thanks, Shannon. We, I know we have a, a few minutes here, Don, before uh, Keith Parsons join us. Do we want to do a little Q&A from the audience? Yeah, that'd be great if we can got a couple minutes left. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's go back to Rocky. Here's a question um, from our audience. How many FTEs do you need to dedicate to focus on analyzing data provided, provided and maintaining the tools? Wow, that is a great question. Um, so I, I have one FTE who probably spends 70% of his time in the tool. Um, and that's pretty proactive. Um, so he spends a lot of time um, looking at what are the best tests for us to run, coming up with what our baseline should be, what the KPIs are that Nike expects rather than what KPIs are across the industry. Um, and he's, um, you know, we just kind of turn to him and say, I'm worried about this building, give me some baselining data. Um, so 60, 70% of his time is dedicated to 7Signal. Um, and then a backup for him who's spending about 20% of his time, but he's also spending time coming up to speed. Um, the rest of the team, as we bring on new buildings, bring up the eyes themselves. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't consider that, you know, FTEs dedicated to the tool. And I think we, again, are really proactive and could manage the tool with out someone quite so dedicated to it. Um, it once set up, it's not that cumbersome. I can go in and pull reports myself, but, um, and anyone on my team can, um, but we really want to leverage the tool as much as possible. So I do dedicate a lot of time to it. Thanks, Rocky. Yeah. Uh, Shannon, maybe one last question here from the audience. Uh, Here's a question. Uh, I work in a university environment with students coming from many different countries. How big is a problem of mobility uh, with the five gigahertz experience using Wi-Fi devices from uh, one regulatory domain to another? <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> so, you know, it's not as much of a problem as it used to be. And that, that also goes back to where we've kind of engaged with the different regions. And we said, you have to have sensors in different regions. That was another, hey, we need to make sure we have sensors monitoring Wi-Fi uh, in which the access points operate under different regulatory domains. So and it's not as much of a problem. Uh, we also are very much into global standards and ensuring that when you walk into, say, the IBM site in Taiwan, the access points uh, are the same model. They follow the same Wi-Fi survey. 
uh, as every other country. They're running the same code level and that standard configuration template as, say, uh, our site in uh, California. Um, but even with that, uh, you know, I mentioned before in Malaysia, we had an issue where the country allowed an addition of a channel. And even two years later, there were still older MacBooks because they couldn't apply the change to a device driver. It was embedded into the adapter. It just, you know, didn't work. Um, so we still run into them once in a while, but it's not nearly as prevalent as I think it was a few years ago, especially now that Wi-Fi is the primary form of, of connectivity. I think that the, the laptop, the adapter uh, makers, the driver uh, makers or writers, they're all keeping up with the latest standards and realize they, they can't go, go lax, that they have to be maintaining their hardware and driver levels uh, and our access point vendors to the latest that are out there. I think when 6E is released, which adds more channels, I think that's when there's the potential to see again, hey, this access point supports these 6E channel sets, but maybe this uh, laptop doesn't. And that's, um, you know, how we kind of deal with that is we still have 2.4, but we, we tell people we don't support 2.4. It's there for some really old stuff. But if you call into us with a problem, we're going to help you get working on 5 gigahertz. Uh, and so we actually had to work with our client teams when we started instituting that to actually push out the latest driver that supports 5 gigahertz, push the setting in which you prefer 5 gigahertz. So that's something we'll do within our corporation is not just deploy access points that support 6C, but we'll also work with our client teams to make sure they're pushing out the settings so that the clients um, uh, do support and use that. But what will be difficult is when we have customers come in that don't. And that's why uh, you know, we still have the 2.4 around and haven't disabled that everywhere. So we all also have to be mindful of being able to support some of those older technologies until they are more prevalent across the board. It's like an ongoing challenge. Well, I really want to thank uh, Shannon and Rocky for joining us on our customer panel and Mark for your input too. Uh, and with, with that, I'll swing it back to you, Don. Thanks a lot, Jim. Shannon and Mark and Rocky, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Well, we're going to continue thank on here. Uh, we've got Keith Parsons joining us next. He's going to talk to us a little bit about WLPC 21 and the ongoing uh, excitement around that event. I think he's got some interesting announcements to make today. We're excited to hear those. Keith, how are you doing this morning? Doing great, no problem at all. Enjoying the conversations we've been having so far. Excellent, well, thanks for, for joining us. So um, Keith, I'm gonna hand it over to you. And, and before I do that, I. Uh, want you to know that I did really poorly on the trivia questions you sent over. <laughs> they, they were stumpers. I, I'm keeping Jim here with me so he can, he can uh, fill in the gaps. We, you know, what's interesting about that last segment, and we got a lot of credibility around the community that we're, we've created here at Seven Signal, and we're giving back every week with webinars. And I think it's a great segue to you because in my opinion, and Jim's and a lot of us here, you are the community. You know, the CWNE number three, um, all the content you put out for everybody, uh, just really exciting. So I, I wanted to make sure that we give you that plug. We, we really appreciate everything you do for us. Glad, glad to help. I am the community. I, I've never felt that way before. <laughs> I, actually, actually, I feel like I'm serving the community as, a, as an easier way to go about doing it. So what did you, on, on the trivia questions, which one did you get wrong? So I got the year we started wrong. Um, and what, what was the one we were talking about this morning, Jim? Uh, the, the city of the first of the Oh, the city, right. I got right. that wrong too, actually. Well, that's where we can, we can go over those and give everyone a little little feedback. So if you're ready, I've got my slide deck ready to share. Perfect. Well, welcome. 
Uh, my name is Keith Parsons, and I've been on a couple of these uh, webinars before with Seven Signal. Love the products and, and how they help you make your network better. Uh, they asked me to talk a little bit about WLPC, Wireless Land Professionals Conference. So I'll give a little history and kind of tell us where we're at and how we got here. So first of all, 2021 should be the year of opportunity. We had we, we kind of want to forget 2020. Um, and I just like to publicly thank all the frontline workers. My, my wife's a nurse, my son's a nurse, my other daughter's a nurse, my son was a dentist, and they're all dealing with this on the front line as it, as it comes to them, as well as you know, literally millions of others who are having to work with this, as well as those who maybe lost their work because of COVID. But that was last year. Hopefully we have a lot more optimism coming this year with vaccines. Myself, I was lucky enough to get both doses of vaccine. I was also unlucky enough to catch COVID, so I was positive for a while. But again, pretty lucky that it wasn't so bad that I didn't have to get hospitalized. Really. I have a feeling, think, feeling more in the heart, thinking is more in the brain, and I feel and think both. The business travel will be returning. There is a pent up demand to return to life as normal. Now, I don't think we're gonna to be totally normal. That would be difficult, um, but it is returning. Uh, one sign that I just heard of this morning that uh, Mobile World Congress in Barcelona will be a live event this July. In fact, I was supposed to go to Mobile World Congress in Barcelona last March. It was all scheduled, had tickets ready to go, and they ended up canceling at the last minute. It was kind of the first really big event that, that had to cancel because of COVID. And they're also now going to be one of the first returning to a live event. Luckily for us, last year, uh, WLPC was probably the last live event a lot of you attended. Remember, you still have to stay safe. Even though I've had the vaccine, I've had the disease, you still have to wear masks, you still have to mitigate risk, you still have to do all those things that we learned over the last year to help you and others to stay safe around you. So the community health, our community, the wireless line professionals community, is still number one priority. But it's both health and well-being. Well-being is a lot of us are really, really uh, getting frustrated, and we have this this fatigue from coming just doing virtual only. So hopefully we can uh, add some optimism, and I'll share a little bit about what we're planning on this year. So a little history. First one was in Austin. And um, it was a total fluke. We, we picked the city. It happened to be a hotel that got turned, that used to be a command center for shooting off you know, nuclear missiles. So it's kind of a cool place. And I just said, we need something for wireless land professionals to go and not be, okay, I'll back up a little bit. You know, when you go to Google, you don't pay a thing for it, for Google Mail, for all sorts of things. You don't pay for Facebook. And since you don't pay for it, you can also figure you are what they're selling, access to you. Well, I've been going to trade shows oh, way too many years, 40 years or so now, from old Comdexes to network, net world to uh, interop to networld interop to just interop to a whole bunch of them. And in all of those shows, you are the target. They're trying to sell you something. Along the way, they have sessions where you can learn things. And I attended uh, Tech Field Day by Stephen Foster and realized that there is a really nice way to transfer information across from vendors to end users. Now, his model was about having 12 people go into a room who were bloggers, and then the vendors gave a presentation, very technical, very useful, and then they would blog about it. And that's kind of the backwards thing that I was after. What I wanted was a conference where everyone could get the experience of being a tech field day delegate, but not that the vendors didn't pay. Because you know what happens when vendors pay? Yeah, that means they just bought you. So our first conference in Austin was all about not pain. No vendors, there was no vendors allowed. 
Now, individuals who work for vendors could come, and we did it all the time. We then held one in Maastricht, in, uh, near Amsterdam, outside of Amsterdam, and then continued on to Dallas. And then we found a home in Phoenix. You can tell we've been staying in Phoenix for a while. And then we tried a couple of places in, in Europe as well. Sadly, we didn't get to do Europe this year because of COVID. But our Phoenix place has a new home. For four years, we stayed at one specific hotel. One, it made it easy for us. We knew exactly the size of the rooms and how many people we could fit. And one of the problems we've had with each and every WLPC we have ever done, all 14 so far, has been we sell them out. They sell out. We don't run out of rooms. And our last hotel was too small. And for the last couple of years, we had to use an overflow hotel. It's kind of a pain because you have to be in a different hotel and come back to the hotel every night. So we found a new home. So we'll be returning back to the same home where we have enough space to go. Now, WLPCs aren't about me. They're not about the vendors. They're really not about the technology. But that's kind of why we come, because we care about the technology. What it is, is it's all about the people. You go there to meet other people who do the same thing you do, who hang out and have the same activities in the evening that you do, that like the same jokes, that hang out together. And so we're trying to build this community and give you a place to go where you feel comfortable. We also have, obviously, presentations, again, all about the people. The people are doing the presentation. So even though a vendor might show up, Chuck Wichesky from HP Aruba, when he presents, He's presenting us Chuck. They didn't pay to be there. In fact, all of our presentations start with a, we do a call for presentation, we get the papers back, we send out a survey, and the attendees vote. Those who get voted highest get the longest time periods. For the last couple of times, we've had between three and four times more presentations that have been presented, that have been submitted, than we even have time slots for. So it, it'll, hold on, we'll be coming, we're gonna do a, a call for a presentation soon. So my thanks to all of the attendees, all the presenters, everyone who comes and do this, I couldn't do it without the people. For me, it's just a way for me to go and, and get a conference where I get to do what I'd like. I wanna sit and learn and hang out with my friends and not have anyone try to sell me anything. So in 2020, just a couple numbers, we started doing boot camps before. And so the three days prior to WLPC, we do a boot camp. We had 11 of them, CBMA, CBSP, DP, AP, all of the CBMP classes, ECSE, a whole range of boot camps. So for people who only can go to one thing a year, uh, or if they have Cisco CLCs that they can spend, we have Cisco boot camps as well. And then we have this thing we call deep dives. And in February last year, we had 12 deep dives. Now these are five hours in 2021, they're gonna move up to six hours, where you basically get a full day session, hands-on working on something and getting stuff to, to play with. If you take the 3D printing class, you get a 3D printing, uh, 3D printer for that bootcamp. If you take the soldering bootcamp, you get all the cool soldering kits. So for each of the bootcamps, you're either making or building or doing something with your hands with real equipment. We had, this time around, half of the attendees attended the bootcamp, which is great. I mean, that's, that's hundreds of people get to be together for an entire week this way. Another thing I'm very proud of is we have about a fifth, 20% of all of our attendees are presenters. Now, we know as we keep growing, and we've grown 400% since we got started, that we, that number is going to go down. But it's still pretty high that the 20% of the people who are attending are actually presenting. The presenters are other people just like you, and you too can be a presenter at WOPC. Here's just a little sample agenda from the last one. We have hour-long sessions, we have half-hour sessions, we obviously take breaks, there's all food on site, all the food's there for you. Um, we also have something called 10 Thoughts, where we put people who have like a half-hour presentation, but they only, we only give them 10 minutes to finish it. Uh, I found a lot of presentations start really slow. Hi, my name is Keith. I do this thing. And you know what? There's this thing called BYOD. And they go on to explain what BYOD is. And that uses up most of their time. And then they don't have time to actually get to the content. So we push really hard to, to skip all the introductions and just jump right in. 
Everyone already knows what BYUD is. We don't need to have a definition. Anyways, we have 10 talks and we have the big long chunks at the end of the first two days where you go and work on those deep talks. So 55 minute sessions, just a quick, this was the last cycle round. You two could be involved if you want to present, uh, come up with a presentation idea and we will float it to the audience for both long ones and 10 talks. If you have only a short, think of about a half hour. So don't think of only talking for 10 minutes, prepare for 30. And then we'll just make you talk really fast and, and focus on you. So uh, well, if you only want to attend talk, then flag that. But part of our voting process is to find out the order of what's most important to all of our attendees. Deep dive sessions are where we spend all that, that time from Wireshark, learning how to do Wireshark on wireless, to advanced packet analysis, to working with custom reporting if you need that. All sorts of different things available. If you have an idea of something you'd like to share, we'll use that and put that in our deep dive as well. But by the way, the deep dives are also voted on and we had more than the slots we had. Well, in fact, we added slots because uh, we got some of these got so many votes. Up. So how to present? Skip all the garbage. Just jump right in with what you want to say and share it to the audience. We also don't do Q and A's. Um, especially because Q and A's with hundreds of people in the audience passing around mics, we tried that, it's kind of a pain. And we have, we would like to get as many presentations as we can. We record them all, we submit them all to, out on YouTube for free, a complimentary new one can see them. Uh, our goal at WPC is to get knowledge and share it as much as we can for as little as we can. Now, here's a little slide that I used uh, last conference and it wasn't even a, a, a 10 talk. It was probably a 30 second talk. Okay, maybe a minute. But I thought I'd give it to you today, just as a little bonus here. If you want to get engaged in our community, the wireless LAN community, there's Twitter, Slack, there's uh, direct messaging, LinkedIn, blog posts, comments, emails, all sorts of stuff. If you'd like to get involved, here's the trick of how to do it. First, come up with a sincere technical question. Don't just make up a silly thing that you think somebody's going to answer. Really, you think of something you really need to know. You can ask anyone via those messages, Twitter, Slack, DM, LinkedIn, blog post, email. Find anyone in the industry. And if you go to my website, www.pros.com, there's a list of Twitter people you can follow and blog posts you can follow. And to any of those people, and I'm sure any of the people you presented either at today's webinar seven seven or any of the previous ones, all of those people would be glad to answer your question. So ask them a question. And then you do the research yourself. You're going to ask them a question. They might give you some answer. And in each of those forums, Twitter, Slack, LinkedIn, you're going to have a short form answer. And then you go do the research. When you're done, you write a blog post on what you've learned. I haven't been involved in bloggers for the last decade or so. There's something all bloggers, everyone I've ever talked to, has the same thing happen. They go online to search and, and ask a question to the great wise Google and their own blog post comes back. I do it probably at least once a quarter, I get that exact situation because I knew I had a question and at some point in the past, I did the research and I decided to write about it. You're writing it for yourself, your future self, because you're gonna come back to me. My brain's not big enough to hold all this stuff. And then share your blog with the community. I'll gladly put you on our website, our blog, to, as a guest blogger, you can have your own blog. And then rinse and repeat. Find another technical question. Ask someone on Twitter or Slack. Do the research yourself, write a blog about it, and continue on, and you will soon be in the arena with everyone else. I've seen this exact thing happen. Probably 50, 60, 70 people have been through this technique. And now there's some of the leaders in the industry because they followed this. If you'd like to get engaged, this is how you're going to do it. If you want to join Slack, you can, well, don't hit this URL because it's gone, but I left it on here. But if you DM on Twitter, either May149 or Samuel underscore comments, they can get you into Wi-Fi Pros Slack. It's not wireless and professional. It's just a group of people who care about this and you can easily and freely join 
and engage there. Have fun. Our conferences are about being fun, having being engaged. Talk to other people around you. If you're in a little circle in, at any conference and you're talking to other people, at least a couple of you turn your shoulders. So there's always a space that someone can come and join you. So here's the end result here. Save the date. I am not, absolutely, nobody posts this out on Twitter. This is the new date. I'm just saying we are holding this date in October for both boot camps and the main conference. But right now, truthfully, I'm not going to sign a contract with a hotel that's eight or nine months from now in the current state of COVID. But we know having done 14 of these, it takes us about four to five months from the time we commit and we ask for the call for presentations until the actual event. So we're, we kind of backed that in in late April, early May, we'll be sending out those call for papers and we'll make a commitment. Today, I don't know for sure if the positive optimism that we see the dropping of the COVID hospitalizations, the vaccinations going up, if it's gonna hold. So I'm not personally at this point willing to commit to, the, to lock on the hotel, but within a couple of months, I will feel a lot better about doing that. And so we are locking this date, put it under calendars, um, but wait until early, early May timeframe, and we should be sending out the call for presentation. Get excited and think about it. Thanks, that's all I had today. If you have any questions, I'm glad to answer. Awesome, thanks. Keith, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Keith. And, and for those of us who submitted a presentation uh, in the fall, um, is that still in the database for there, there, WLPC? We have we have all of those, and when we send the one out in May, early May to ask, all you have to do is say yeah, same thing again, and we'll we'll count it. Or hey, it's been a couple months since then. Maybe you have some newer, better idea, um, and it's, it doesn't hurt to to float a couple of those ideas. Uh, we put them out in the survey, we vote on them, and, we, and you know one of yours might make it. Awesome. Looking forward to it. At least, at least I hope so. I'd like Me to too. Keith, thanks so much for joining us today. We're going to keep rolling on. We've got a, a, a product roadmap that I hope you'll stay for today. Uh, Simon Roof is up next. He's our VP of product here at Seven Signal. Simon, I'm going to turn the controls over to you in, in just a moment. But uh, how's everything going down in Nashville? Uh, it's been pretty cold here. Sorry, I couldn't join you up there, Don. Uh, we uh, got iced in, and uh, it wasn't it wasn't pretty uh, conditions out on the road. So, um, did a quick pivot, uh, presenting remotely today. Yeah, Nashville's just not re used to uh, seeing all that ice and snow. No, we. Uh, I, I'd be surprised if there's a single snow shovel in uh, in my entire county. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it is great to be here to talk to you today about our, our product vision at Seven Signal uh, for 2021. Uh, I had about half an hour. I think we're running a bit over time, so I won't uh, won't stand on the formalities. Um, but I'll just start with some uh, quick positioning for those of you who haven't been regulars on our on our webinar series, uh, who will, would have seen this before. Uh, traditional network monitoring tools uh, from the usual providers. Uh, provide perspective of the network from the network infrastructure view. Um, they let you see how things are performing from the inside of the network. Uh, but as we know, many of the wireless experience problems that we uh, occur out here beyond the access point, uh, client devices, their adapters and drivers, configurations, behavior, or in the air with appearance, congestion, and coverage issues. And at 7Signal, you know, we, uh, we have products that allow you to get a unique visibility, unique perspective from the client's perspective and close that critical gap when it comes to monitoring the end-to-end -end digital experience of your users um, and other devices uh, connected to your network. So Seven Signal uh, digital experience monitoring. We have two products, uh, the Sapphire Eye. Uh, these are uh, operating as a perfect client, providing 24 by seven monitoring of your wireless network performance. This, largely what we, we heard IBM and, and Nike talking about uh, today. 
Um, the added benefit of these sensors, they're the most fully featured sensors in the market, uh, doing spectrum analysis in addition to, to just uh, standard testing uh, of the client experience. And we have mobile eye uh, with device agents sitting on end users devices um, on the network, uh, providing actual visibility into the real client experience. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our roadmap for both of these today. It's gonna to be a great year for both of the, these products. We are doubling down on our development capabilities, a significant expansion in resourcing to ensure that we start delivering more quickly on some long promised improvements uh, in Sapphire Eye. And most excitingly to start adding some real value to our customers in mobile eye with some major upgrades to both our agent and our cloud infrastructure. Start with Sapphire Eye. Quick status update, the Sapphire Eye 250 is now available. Uh, the Sapphire I-250 is a, a slightly smaller unit. It has exactly the same capabilities as the 2200, with the exception of the slightly smaller range. Um, it's a smaller form factor, so that makes it suitable for branch office deployments, uh, for small retail environments, for example, uh, and portable enough for temporary deployments as well. Uh, it also operates over the air, so it doesn't necessarily need to be uh, deployed up in the rafters can be deployed very simply without an Ethernet cable um, and use the uh, use your wireless networks for its management channels. You can contact your sales reps if you want more information about the 250. Uh, more broadly in the Sapphire Eye uh, capability set, uh, we are we do have a deployment upcoming soon in March. Uh, we are introducing CDP and link layer detection protocols. Uh, support, it, support on the eye interface, um, the ethernet interface, um, that will advertise the identity of the device to neighboring devices on the network. So you'll have better visibility of uh, where our eyes are plugged in in the network uh, from your, your, from your uh, network infrastructure, but also the ability to identify neighboring devices, switches and ports, for example, in Sapphire Configurator. Um, so if you're trying to hunt down where that, uh, where that eye is connected to, uh, for any, any type of uh, uh, technical reasons, then that'll be feasible. Uh, also introducing some improvements to over the air mode. Looking forward a little bit further, uh, and I know those of you who have been around for a while, uh, we've been working towards some of these goals for some time uh, with our expanded development capacity. We are committed to delivering these on time this year. Currently in usability testing for our simplified uh, topology navigation, um, this is going to allow our users to more easily uh, uh, select the most frequently used free features and reports, make, make generally analyze them much more accessible. Uh, in Q2, uh, we'll also be looking at an improved dashboard, which it will largely be the best features of our IQ dashboard being brought into the analyzer interface uh, and building on that some improved workflows. So instead of manually uh, exercising queries uh, and making selections to drill down into problems, those will become much more automated uh, as we move through a workflow. So really looking forward to seeing those ones come to fruition. In terms of platform improvements, uh, single sign-on uh, is coming in uh, later in the year for Sapphire. This will provide a unified login across both our, our Sapphire and our mobile eye reporting interfaces. Um, this is a key strategic plank for us also as we move towards towards a view of platform integration and being able to provide both sensor views and mobile eye views of the network within a single interface. So the bulk of this presentation is going to be focused on mobile eye. Uh, mobile eye was extremely popular in 2020. Uh, work from home was a big driver of that, uh, but we're seeing um, huge amount of popularity in the product. Uh, we are committed to expanding and increasing development capacity in 2021 um, and positioning everybody for greater success with this product. A uh, little bit about how it's working now, and then we'll talk about some very, very significant changes we're making uh, in the mobile app product architecture. So today the agent will, uh, can be deployed on Windows 10, Mac, Android devices, as well as a number of uh, Linux thin clients. Device takes measurements um, and basically sends all of that information to the cloud. Uh, so hundreds of measurements, it's not really doing anything particularly intelligent, uh, just taking the measurements, sending up to the 
them up to the cloud, which does all of the work in terms of summarizing that data and producing the insights. And the main focus of that, those insights today has been more at an individual device level and less at an infrastructure and all, all of experience level. So the major changes this year, uh, we're making architectural changes to our agents, uh, making our agents smarter, uh, moving client diagnosis uh, to the device so they can become aware of their own problems, um, self-diagnosis and reporting. And we're also making architectural changes in our cloud, making big improvements to multi-device analysis, as well as introducing greater administrative flexibility for managing large deployments. I'll talk about each of these in a bit more detail. So smarter agents. So instead of being just dumb data collectors, we're moving a lot of our analysis, data analysis that we currently do in our cloud out to our agents. Uh, the agents will start to package up uh, analysis and summaries um, and be much more aware of its own problems. Uh, that is going to introduce a number of opportunities uh, to us. Um, those uh, individual device insights and summaries will be sent to the cloud. And that's also going to allow our cloud to focus much more on cross-device, multi-device analysis. So the opportunities uh, from, from the smarter agents better visibility. So by doing analysis on the, on the device, uh, first of all, today we have a test cycle. We might be looking at Wi-Fi scan data every five or 10 minutes and um, so sending that data up to the cloud. A lot of problems on the clients occur in a much shorter time frame than that. And roaming is, was one of those circumstances. So there are some uh, elements and details measurements that we want to take in a much finer grain detail on the agent, but sending every measurement up to the cloud would create very large overheads. So better visibility will allow us to take much finer grain measurements at the agent level and summarize those and package them up before sending them onto the cloud. So fast page changing conditions is gonna be much more readily identifiable. We're gonna be able to be much better within the, the wireless domain in terms of identifying client side problems. The second advantage of packaging those summaries at the device level is the choice of data delivery. So today uh, we send all of our results up to the cloud, up to the seven signal cloud for presentation within the mobile IQ UI. Uh, with those summaries and that analysis being done on the device uh, tomorrow, uh, it opens up two big opportunities. One is uh, to introduce custom endpoints. So we could stream the data directly from client agents to a custom endpoint. Uh, that potentially is going to be an ITSM system or an AI ops system uh, for ingestion alongside other uh, day, I, uh, IT operations monitoring data that is derived from different sources. Uh, the other option that we have is to actually present that data directly to the user in an optional UI. That has the potential to, to give us the ability for uh, end user self-help, uh, tier zero support if you like, um, and the ability to report a problem. So for, from a reactive troubleshooting perspective, uh, users uh, could uh, push button, to say they have a problem, and that could log a ticket in an ITSM system and provide all of the data supporting the problem and the experience of the user at the time. So the other part to this, and just let me have a sip of water, was a smarter cloud. So we are making uh, two major improvements here. One is the ability to better manage large deployments of client agents in the environment. And the second is a new event streaming architecture, which will provide an opportunity for much better analysis of Wi-Fi in infrastructure level problems and shared client experience across large numbers of devices. So a little bit of uh, uh, monitoring endpoints uh, in the enterprise environment, there are a lot of vantage points. So traditional monitoring would look at the, an access point. Um, our sensors in Sapphire I, we, Sapphire 2200 typically covers between five or six access points. So you have less sensors than access points in the network. And when you're monitoring client agent, we're talking about a multiplier effect. So many devices per access point, many access points per floor, many floors per location, uh, many locations. 
Um, and that, so that provides a lot of different vantage points to look at the network and measure experience. Ideally, you deploy that everywhere. Uh, today, but uh, today our agent is very black and white. It's either deployed and testing, or it's not deployed. And that can be limiting for our large customers um, or customers who want to do large deployments. Uh, so we want you to be able to deploy everywhere um, and to understand your device capabilities everywhere and then test when and where you need it to match your business needs. So, Let's take a quick look at a couple of example scenarios here. Um, first one would be a representative sampling approach. So the larger your device space, the less need you have to test frequently on every single device in the network to get a statistically significant picture of the overall health of your client experience. But uh, to get a representative sample, you really need to know how those devices are distributed. So we want to be deployed on every device. We want to be able to understand the operating systems, the OS versions, the makes, the models, the wireless adapters, the driver versions that are out there everywhere, and then sample that to get a cross, a cross sampling of all of the devices um, and a representative sample of, of your environment and how um, di the digital experience is being received. However, you may also have a target group of devices. Uh, they may be a high value group of devices or a high value location, for example. Um, or some area where you're running a project that's of specific interest and you want greater detail on a specific group of devices. So likewise, you would be able to turn on more detailed testing for that group of devices um, that may be running all the time, or it may be, like I said, project-based. And a third use case would be more of a reactive or support or troubleshooting event. Uh, so being able to turn on a specific device uh, in order to, to, to get visibility of that for the time period in which you need to provide the support. Our device agents will maintain a short history of their experiences, so they'll continue to provide the monitoring uh, capability uh, for a short period of time. So when you turn that device on, you'll be able to get visibility into what happened in the last week, uh, even though you've just turned, turned testing on and data collection on at that point. And that's gonna provide a lot greater flexibility uh, in, deploy, in, in deployment. Uh, rather than having to manage software deployments to groups of agents and remove the software again, put it back out there for a different group of agents, uh, being able to deploy once to your entire enterprise and then determine and match your testing to your business needs. I've probably jumped ahead of my slides here. So deploy once throughout the enterprise, less ongoing management, understand the capabilities of all, your, all of your devices. So an inventory, if you like, um, and then choosing which devices test when and matching the density of your testing to your business needs. But it's not just how much data you collect, it's also what you do with it. Uh, and so the second part of our, our, our program, updating our cloud architecture, uh, is really designed to um, improve these screens, uh, which those of you with mobile eye will recognize. Uh, these are our dashboards, our, oh, essentially our multi-device views. Uh, and we're really focused on less red, a big feedback item for us, and more insights, more intelligent insights uh, into the client experience, uh, providing clear views of your overall health uh, of digital experience in the network, uh, a focus on surfacing problem areas and making root cause identification much more efficient, uh, and providing workflows that fit multiple users within your environment, whether that's a management views, broad operations monitoring, or problem identification and analysis for a wireless network engineer, or perhaps a lower skilled uh, staff member from a Wi-Fi perspective, lower skilled, um, who needs to see what's going on in the network. So we're currently implementing a new event streaming architecture over the next couple of months, making use of the latest technology and tools for data processing and analysis. Um, this is going to power alarms infrastructure, which we expect to be available late in Q2. Uh, and a, again, a big, big feature request for alerts and alarms on mobile eye and power the delivery of much richer insights and analysis uh, of the data collected across large numbers of devices. Um, in parallel to this, we're really um, 
we were kicking off a major design project in user experience to ensure that we maximize the ability of our users to uh, be awesome uh, and productive uh, with our tools. Uh, that will be focusing on those user interface updates right there um, for the dashboard, the Wi-Fi, the platforms, our end-to-end -end analysis, um, the reports that we provide. Uh, and that's a project we'd like to invite you to participate in. Uh, there will be a quick poll question coming up at the end here um, for anybody who is interested in participating in focus groups or responding to surveys uh, just to register your interest so we can uh, we can reach out to you uh, it's very important to us that we uh, undertake a big project like this with our, our customers experience in mind uh, and we'd love you all to get involved so just a quick recap uh, in 2021 with mobile eye uh, we're focusing on smarter client agents uh, making themselves aware, letting them self-diagnose and report, uh, as well as more administrative flexibility to deploy, deploy agents broadly, match testing to your business needs, and some big improvements in our, in our user experience and our, uh, our cross-device analysis uh, on the mobile IQ UI. We can throw that poll up now if you like, uh, Don. And um, I don't know if there's any, uh, any questions that have come in uh, that anybody would like me to address, but. Uh... Awesome job. I, I don't see any questions coming in. A lot of comments as you were going on. Great feedback around the 250 and the form factor. Uh, several comments there. Some comments around the CDP and LLDP support and a lot of chatter around the user interface um, being on the device for the end user being able to uh, do some troubleshooting in the future. Just really cool stuff. Great feedback there. Excellent. Thank you, Don. Is it time for Kelsey? It is. Very exciting stuff. Simon, before we let you go, thank you so much. Uh, great job. Very exciting. Um, for those of you who are very familiar with Seven Signal, you know Simon just joined the team here. Um, how long has it been, Simon? Uh, it was April last year, so we, we, we're, we're coming, up up, on a year. coming up on a year pretty quickly. Very exciting stuff. We, we love having you here. Great asset to us. Thanks so much, Simon. Thanks, Don. Okay, for those of you who are still with us, and there's a great deal of you who still are, I think that Oculus 2 is going to be a big hit. Um, just as we did at our last user conference, we are going to have a, another game here and name that tune. And Kelsey Rizzuto is with me. She is a, a familiar face to you all. She's with you all every week with Jim on our weekly webinars. I bet you didn't know that she has a lot of musical talent. So uh, Kelsey, what are we going to do here? Yeah, so today we're going to play Name That Tune. As Don just mentioned, we played this at our last virtual user group. And it's pretty much exactly like it sounds. I'm going to play a handful of famous songs, um, the intro or a little snippet of it. And if you could, please try to guess what song I'm playing and enter your answers into the chat panel. And Don will monitor that and see who guesses correctly first. That's right. So I'm going to be looking for not only the name of the song, but one of the artists. There's a couple songs that have multiple uh, artists that had it, but Correct. that's what I'm going to be looking for. So get your fingers ready to enter into chat. All right. So we're going to start with this first one. When we were practicing yesterday, this stumped the team. So we'll see if you all are a little bit luckier here. Do we need a hint, Don? I think you need a hint. Our first hint is Fleetwood Mac. Landslide. Correct. All right, we got Trey there for the first one. Good job, Trey. All right, moving forward here. For those of you who do play guitar, this is usually the first riff that they teach you as a trick. So let's see who can guess this correctly. Oh man, lots of coming through here. 
Which one was the first one? Let's see. Smoke on the water is obviously correct. Deep purple. And Kurt is first. Good job, Kurt. Okay, moving on to number three here. We're going to take it down south. Let's see if you can guess this one. Uh, that's a familiar answer? one. Yeah, we did. Uh, Trey was first in the draw there. He's going to take the lead uh, over a Kurt. So he's got two. Well done, everybody. Lots. Uh, we probably got a dozen come in there within the same time frame. Awesome. Okay, moving forward here. Let's see if you can guess this one. Yes, we got it. We got well, awesome. we got several. Uh, looks like David jumped in there first, ACDC back in black. So we've got uh, two with one. That's David and Kurt. And then Trey's got two. All right. Moving forward here. This one might be a little bit more difficult. So let's see if you all get this. Yes, <laughs> man, I'll tell you what, Trey knows his music. Maybe Trey's <laughs> I thought musician. that was going to be a tough one. I thought that free, was too. So free fallen Tom Petty, uh, Trey is taking a commanding lead, but don't give up. We've got one, two, three, four more songs left. So you've got a chance to tie him up. All right, let's see if you all get this one. This one might be hard too, to be honest. Let's see. All right, lost my place here. Okay. Yeah, man, oh man, there's no stumping this group. Oh, Paul, <laughs> a crazy little thing called love. Awesome. That is by Queen, for those of you who are not familiar. All right, moving right along here. Let's Get see about three this more. one. Yep, here we go. Who can overtake Trey? Got it. Kevin, Kevin, quick on the draw there. Heart of Gold, Neil Young. Awesome job. Excellent. Kevin, great. I'm making this a contest. We've got two songs left. We've got Trey with the lead. He is up by two points on Kurt, David, Paul, and Kevin. Okay, Don, I really think this one will stump people. All right, I let's think see this one might be the hardest one to guess. All right. But for those of you who are country music fans, maybe it won't be that hard. So let's see. We're stumping them. We're stumping them. Okay. Need a clue, maybe. Our first clue is Brooks and Dunn. So not the Dixie Chicks. Not the Dixie yeah. Chicks, no, <laughs> no. You're in the right mind frame though. We need another clue? Give us one more clue. Should we start, maybe we could sing a little bit? Let's see what you got. Got about it. you yeah. don't do something for me ain't nothing about it? you yep dan nailed it good job dan very good dan dan is in the running we've got one more all right this one might be a stump or two but let's see and then on this one i'll i'll announce the name if it's not trey um or if it is trey i guess we'll know and he'll be the winner but you're going to play us out and i'm going to thank everyone for being here today perfect all right here we go Here we go. 
chorus. Yeah, there's stuff. Let's see what you got. Okay. You got a, you got a uh, trivia piece in there? We have Crowded House. Crowded House. I'll give it another 10 seconds and then I'm going to call it for Keith. Oh, let's see. Uh, uh, don't think till it's over. That is correct. Close. And don't dream. Don't dream it's over. Uh, don't dream it's over. It's well, that was enough. pretty there close. Anders. Uh, good to see you, Anders. Uh, he nailed it. So he, you guys made it interesting, but Trey ran away with it. Um, I won't drop a last name in here, but uh, Trey, you know who you are. Keep playing, uh, Kelsey. Um, thank you very much to, to all of you for coming today. Special thanks to our panelists today, um, Shannon and Rocky and Jim Vada and Simon, uh, Tom Barrett, Keith Parsons. Everybody, thank you so much for coming today. Enjoy the rest of the week. We'll see you next Wednesday on our webinar. Bye-bye.